tātou wairua tapu, hei a whina, hei toho tohu i o mātou mahi nui a tātou i tēnei rā. Ko hei krai tuku tō mātou kai whakaura. Āmin. 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 Uh, in opening the meeting, can I just uh, pass on uh, our very grateful thanks to the Tauranga City Council uh, and the Civil Defence Emergency Management Work uh, that they have been responding to the cyclone. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that it's only the Western Bay Tauranga councillors included, plus our chairman who are here uh, in the chambers today, uh, and all other councillors who are in other constituencies are on Zoom. Uh, thanks to the staff who were able to get here safely, uh, and again, we have a number of staff online. But uh, to Julie and Michelle, uh, Mary, Laura, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry, I haven't got my glasses on, <laughs> uh, welcome, and I know Glenn Crowther is also um, somewhere around. So just an opening uh, statement as per <coughs> our normal protocol regarding live streaming just reminding everyone that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording will be made available uh, on our website following the meeting. Just a reminder also that local government decision-making affords no protection to councillor, councillors, staff and the public for comments made during meetings that are subsequently challenged in a court of law and deemed to be slanderous. I'm sure we'll never have any examples of that. So without further ado, we're into it. Apologies. We have an apology from Councillor Knees. I'll move it be accepted. Seconded Councillor von Dardelsen. All those in favour are against carries. There is no public forum. Uh, we do have a late item uh, that uh, we need a resolution to have included on the agenda. And the uh, proposed resolution is as follows, <clears throat> that we receive the report by a Plenty Regional Council Natural and Built Environment Bill and Spatial Planning Bill submissions and accepts it as an item not on the agenda. We note the reason why the item wasn't on the agenda is that time was needed to incorporate feedback received on the draft submission versions and that meant that the item wasn't ready for the agenda when it was finalised and the reason why it cannot be delayed is that the submissions must be lodged by the 19th of February 2023, and that would have to be the longest resolution I think <laughs> I've ever seen. As seconded by Councillor Shirley. Thank you, Councillor Shirley. I'm going to put that, all those in favour, aye against and carried. Uh, order of business, uh, just to note, Councillors, that the presentation on the Bay of Plenty Aquatic um, <clears throat> stock take report uh, is to be taken at 10 a.m. Uh, due to the availability of our presenter, Dean Howie, uh, Maureen Dean. Uh, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? There are none. Any public excluded? No, there is no public excluded business to be transferred into the items, item open. So without further ado, a uh, really a very warm welcome to Michelle Elborn and Julian Fitter. Bay Conservation Alliance. Just a reminder, 15 minutes, 10 for you and five for us, um, if that's okay. Really, thank you again for making uh, the time and opportunity to come. Really looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Mike's at the ready. <laughs> okay. Um, Morena, everybody. Um, ko Michelle Awantoku Ingoa. Um, firstly, um, yes, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you today, and I'm glad everyone is here safe. Um, and well wishes out to the region, particularly down to the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Um, I hope today fares okay. Um, so, yes, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you, and also welcome to the new councillors who joined uh, last year, and you'll be getting your feet under the table now. Um, so, a warm 
warm welcome. So I'm just going to give a, t a little bit of an overview to bay conservation, but today I mainly want to focus on just giving you an insight into the activities of some of our member groups. Um, that's where the sort of the, the rubber hits the road in terms of real conservation outcomes. So just to give you a feel of some of the sort of opportunities, challenges and so on that those groups are, are um, involved in. Um, so Bay Conservation is an incorporated society. Our main role is to support community-led conservation across the Bay of Plenty. Um, and our vision is through collaboration, the ecosystems um, and indigenous biodiversity of the Bay of Plenty is restored. And that doesn't seem... Yeah, no. um, and our purpose is to support and grow the capability and impact of our communities and partners to restore and preserve indigenous biodiversity. Oh, sorry, Michelle. Oh, are you right? Go. Lovely. Yeah. Well Thank done. <laughs> um, so we have um, funding kindly through yourselves, through your community initiatives fund. And I might just get you to control that, Julian, yeah. today. Um, so I just thought I'd share what um, your um, our commitment is to you through that funding. Um, so we provide professional operational support through field administration and funding. And I just thought I'd share a little bit about um, funding. So we, we um, apply for funding on behalf of our member groups. And we've been keeping a tab on how much funding we've secured for those groups since we started back in 2019. Um, and we're close to one point four million dollars that we have um, basically accessed on behalf of those me member groups over that period of time. Um, we have a commitment to you to grow the number of BOP care groups supported by BCA by 18 over the three years we have funding um, through yourselves through this current LTP and we commit to delivering a minimum of three training events per year so that is around the capability building side. So um, community conservation models, I do want to share. Um, that not one size fits all. Um, and so many of our member groups operate in different ways. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of what the local community needs are um, and meeting those um, requirements. So um, I'm just first going to talk to Friends of the Blade. So this is a care group that operates in the Kaimai Mamakus. They're now looking after 300 hectares of forest in the Whakamaramara area. Um, a really fantastic group. Um, you'll see the gentleman in the middle there. We um, awarded him a, an outstanding contribution to conservation at our member group event at the end of last year, Colin Hewins. He's now in his early 80s. He's made a phenomenal contribution over his time. And he got to a point um, really driven by health challenges that he needed to step back as chair of the group. Now, this is quite a common sort of challenge um, to re replenish chairs, especially when they're the founder of the group and they've put so much time and energy into the group. So this team worked particularly well to resolve that actually they weren't going to continue with that chair model. They tried to attract a new chair. It was really challenging. So what they've done is they've they've developed a committee where they've really shared the roles and responsibilities across that committee rather than really significantly loading one person. And that approach is working really, really well. So they're taking a much stronger team approach. And I think that's, yeah, just an, ex an excellent example of kind of remodeling how you may have functioned previously. Otani Wanaku Kiwi Trust is the next group that I'd like to talk about. So again, a long-standing group, 20, 20 years old now, um, <clears throat> operating, um, managing 1,200 hectares of um, forest out at Otani Wanuku. Started with one kiwi, known kiwi in the forest 20 years ago. They're now sitting at around 23. Now, that's fantastic that there's 23, but I still also reflect that 20 years on, you know, that's a lot of work too. And so it just shows how hard it is to increase those numbers. And it's an ongoing challenge around pest control on a regular basis. This is a group that has significant volunteer involvement, 100 plus volunteers that are, that are, that are quite active on a regular basis. 
Um, so that requires significant management of those volunteers. They also translocated Kokako into that forest a number of years ago. They've done two translocations in the past, and then now talking about a third translocation that they're keen to undertake, basically to increase the genetic diversity of that area. Now, the, um, they have taken very much a volunteer-led approach where they haven't had any paid capability. So a year and a half ago, we really encouraged them to think about some contracted paid capability to support them with that Kokako translocation. The really important part about Kokako translocations is the iwi engagement side of things and making sure that from the host area, which they're ideally wanting Kokako to come outside of the Bay of Plenty, into the Bay of Plenty on this occasion because of the genetic diversity diversity needs um, and then obviously making sure that local iwi in the receiving end are comfortable and are supportive. So um, we supported Otani Wanuku to get some funding from TECT. They now have a part-time um, paid coordinator that at large is focusing on the iwi engagement needs for this particular um, activity um, and that may take a couple of years um, to go through um, so that they can have everything in place to make sure that that, um, that, that basically flows as it needs to. Um, the next group that I'd like to talk to is Project Porori, um, formerly the Uratara Estuary Managers operating around um, Katikati. Um, so a huge catchment management project was very much driven by volunteers initially. Um, and this is an example of a project that's, that's transitioned to be pretty large scale. Um, so they attracted um, MFE Freshwater Improvement Funding. They've had a fantastic relationship with yourselves for many years. So co-funding coming into this project from the Regional Council. Um, they've built multiple um, community relationships. They're focusing very strongly on iwi relationships at the moment and they're now in a place where they actually employ eight paid staff and they have an operating budget of a million dollars a year currently so those funds obviously um, you know have a certain time period on them and they'll need to look at where um, future funding comes in um, but this is an example of where we've started voluntary we've seen the, the opportunities and the need to bring in paid capability to really accelerate the outcomes from an environmental perspective there are still volunteer inputs to this project um, so, yeah, again, a really different model that we're seeing here in the Bay. Uh, the next example I'll provide is, is Julian's, um, so Moe's out in Makatu, um, and again, quite a different model to this project. So um, Moe's is very much now focused on being a social enterprise. As you know, employment opportunities in Makatu are not far and wide. Um, so the Makatu project has provided some great opportunity for local employment. Mo's um, employ um, four local people um, undertaking um, programs out there. They now run five EPs um, in partnership with regional council, along with a no number of other contracts. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, some of the shorebirds um, populations and so on, really seeing some fantastic outcomes out in this area. Can I just add that three of those employees are Tangata Penua? Um, the next project I'll give you an insight into is the Manawahe Kokako Trust and Eco Trust. Um, two groups um, with a similar focus, but have been operating independently down in the Eastern Bay of Plenty, um, both with aging volunteers leading those projects, coming to a realization that actually the, the most sensible strategy for them is to now merge. Um, so we'll, we're working with them at the moment to support that merger, um, I guess, from a legal sort of perspective, um, but also from a resourcing um, and so on. So just, yeah, an opportunity. And I guess one of the things we're always sort of pushing is, you know, we're strong together and really sort of pushing that collaboration opportunity so the administration load will reduce when those two groups become one and the last group I'll just share a little a bit of an insight into is um, Kaharoa Kokako Trust so this is our longest standing care group in the Bay of Plenty out um, towards Rotorua um, focused on Kokako and, and all the um, different species in that forest um, now, um, this group undertook a Kokako census back in 2015, and they had 173 birds at that stage. 
Um, they then undertook their latest census last year, seven years on, and their sense as a group was that the Kokaka numbers would have increased. Now, when they got the results, they were very surprised to find a 30% decrease in the population, and that was a bit of a shock for them. Um, so they've done, they've brought in a lot of experts to try and understand the rationale around that. Um, and there are a number of sort of ex explanations. The original kind of count may have been slightly over what it should have been. Um, they recognise that the average bird lives for 20 years, so there will be a number of adult um, birds that will have died off in that time period. They're expecting maybe 40 or 50 could actually account for that. Um, so they are realising that there has also been some recruitment. They're thinking around 30 new birds have been recruited in, um, but it is making them look at, um, you know, their pet control, they're planning to upgrade all of their stoat traps, they're infilling all of their bait stations. So I think just an example of where you just can't relax, um, you're constantly um, having to, um, you know, just keep focusing and looking at how you can fine tune and upgrade these projects, particularly where pest control is concerned. Sorry, and then just one more that I was quickly going to mention is KEEP, which is a project that Bay Conservation in particular is really excited about. So this is one of our member groups that joined a year or so ago. They're an unconstituted group. Um, it, it involves a Kokako corridor, which will essentially connect Otaniwanuku to Kaharoa. Um, there's a lot of landowners and um, iwi and a whole group of people sitting around the table that didn't want to constitute and form another charitable trust. So we've taken them on board. Our plan is to fund hold any funding on behalf of this group for operations and we've got an um, application lodged with Bay Trust currently to support this um, and a really exciting this is about thinking landscape and this is going bigger picture. So just a few um, collective learnings to share with you. Um, so what we're really realising from our groups is that good governance and succession planning can be really challenging, especially the chairs, the founders that want to move on, who can come in and step into those shoes. So are there different models like Friends of the Blade have looked at that can help address that? The scale of back-end administration work for groups is, is, is significant, especially when you're doing big things like translocations, and there's lots of requirements around that. Um, growing community capability is a key priority, and so that's where you know, we're still really committed to education from a school level through to the cadet program, through to workshops for our volunteers, grow more capability so that they're enabled to um, deliver better outcomes. We really see the value of combining professional and volunteer volunteer input together. So those groups that have got some professional input um, can really then also um, unlock more support from BCA than the groups that have only got volunteers because it's hard for them to respond to us and actually say what they need. Longer term funding, like any project, is always really, really helpful and we need to be thinking landscape. And just finally, I think, you know, one of the um, sort of ethos is of, of setting up Bay Conservation and what we sort of push on a regular basis is all about collaboration. So whether that be with agencies, with iwi, with, um, yeah, different players, um, the more that we can work together, the more that we can achieve. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> uh, superb presentation, Julian, uh, Michelle. Question time, five minutes, Max, uh, Councillor McMillan. Oh, kia ora. great to hear that. And what you're talking about there is, you know, best practice nonprofit. It's really great to see how you bring everyone together and, and have realised all these challenges, you know, with an ageing volunteer population and all of that. But um, the question I had was around, Julian, I know we talked about this with, um, you know, corridors connecting and thinking landscape as, as you've identified. What do you see the role of regional council here? Like how... Would you see us in best practice, pie in the sky, dream world? What would we do to enable that better? I think that the, the big thing is to recognise the importance of a variety of different groups, as Michelle has outlined, 
some of our groups are are very largely professional run and and for big projects it's really difficult to run on volunteers because of health and safety nowadays becomes increasingly difficult got to train everybody up and training volunteers can be very expensive because they can then disappear next week to south island or somewhere so so i think uh, recognizing the variety there uh, of of the different groups there and the need to 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 nurture the volunteers but actually ensure ensure that there's the professional work there to, to go in i mean michelle p- pointed out that you know one of the p- points she made was the amount of time that goes into admin mm-hmm. i put a huge amount of time into admin you know i'm, I'm here as a volunteer today um but you know and so the, the but the admin becomes the bigger the op- the operation the more successful it is the bigger the admin problem is be- becoming and i would you know hap- would anybody take my job no because there's no salary goes with it <laughs> so you know i can't, can't we can't Ad, we could advertise, but we know we wouldn't get anybody to to say yes. So I think you know, looking at the variety of things, and we, you know, there are there are occasional issues we have with regional council that I've had that were, you know was suggested to me the other day that we might be treated as contractors, and and and, and um, I know we do contract work. Essentially, our EPs are contracts with regional council, but we are we go way beyond what a contractor would do. Uh, we are, we why I have a slightly derogatory term. We, we are not Fulton Hogan. We we do what we do the mahi. We do what needs to be done, and that's what groups do. They go over and beyond what's actually required necessarily because they have a a bit of ownership in that that area. But Michelle, you may have a, a, an opinion on that too. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think it's just being in the room and being open to sort of new ideas and ways of doing things. Sometimes, so you know, you've got a regional council staff member sitting at the keep table currently, and that's fantastic. You know, and I know Project Priori talk really highly about the relationship that they have with your team, um, your land management team. So I think it's continuing to do that, but keeping an open mind as to you know where projects might go and how they can be delivered. The betting order is now. Councillor Shirley, Councillor Crosby, Councillor Von Dardelsum and the Chairman, and uh, we're going to then have to go <coughs> because we're running out of time. So, <laughs> Councillor Shirley. Yes, well, thank you for that presentation. I, I found it uh, very impressive. As a, as a new councillor and relatively new to the Bay of Plenty, I did not appreciate the, the strength of the groups that you outlined there, the six examples you gave us, I, I found you know, very, very interesting. What, what my question is and what I'm interested in um, I'm a great believer in the strength of community-based groups, um, bottom-up. Um, they really work. Um, but what I'd like to know is how formal is the alliance in terms of the governance? Uh, are you elected from the collective uh, groups that you mentioned? Um, do they? How do they belong to the alliance? Um, I perhaps should have known this, but I don't. I, so I'm just seeking clarification on how that works. Well, okay, that's quite a big question. I'll try and be quickish. Um, so we are an incorporated society. So our member groups um, have the opportunity to put forward representation to our board. Um, with changes to the incorporated society, we are looking at the structure right now. Um, we've generally tried to in- encourage as many of our member groups to have a seat on the Bay Conservation Board, but interestingly, they don't want to. Um, so our foundation members that started us have had a seat, but as they've maybe for personal reasons started to um, now sort of move on, we're finding it quite difficult to get member group representatives onto our board. And my realisation is, is that, that those groups all have their own governance to run they generally join bca because they want an easier life and they want support and they don't want another governance role so we're actually at a point of having to think about whether we change to a charitable trust in the future Um, we have submitted on the changes to the incorporated society and have asked for some tweaks within that that would help us sort of retain the structure that we are because we want to represent our membership so that's where yeah, we're the, at. the new Incorporated Society Act is quite a, you know, has not really looked at some, I think some of the issues with sports clubs are, are similar, but it, you know, if you have a lot of members, it's quite difficult to, to comply with the new act. And so that we've got, we, we the, the change, we may have to make a change if the act isn't changed. Kind of a supplementary, um, just following on from that, it would seem that uh, the alliance would be perfectly placed to sort of stop unnecessary replication and duplication and streamline and if you somehow could keep it together as an umbrella group to do all those generic functions that's spread across all of those groups uh, it would be a a very efficient effective model I would think. That was certainly my vision when I set it up. Mm -hmm. And my apologies to Councillor White 
Um, I, I didn't see your hand up, so you are now introduced into the batting order. So it's now you, Councillor Crosby, Councillor Von Darlson, and the Chairman. Have I got? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And good morning, Julian and Michelle. Good to see you again. And thank you for the update. I was just reflecting on, on the issue, and you partly answered it around, um, you know, governance and people just wanting to get out there and do stuff rather than sit around a committee table. But it is an important part because, you know, if you have strong governance, then all, of, all the rest flows quite well. Is, do you think there's an opportunity as part of um, your role and the support maybe from others uh, to assist in that space of, of learning governance and leadership? And Because it can be intimidating. I know we've all gone through it when we were younger and um, it is quite a scary thing, but when you get into it, it's actually quite rewarding. And as part of the development of not just the entities, but as individuals within those entities that potentially there could be some, you know, work to be done there to help grow that future leadership coming through uh, and volunteerism. Have you thought about how or maybe, but I'm happy to sit down with you on that uh, at a future date to work through some opportunities. Yeah, no, that would be great. Um, it's Yes, it is an area that we thought about. So about a year ago, we funded a number of um, volunteers on governance um, to go through the Institute of Directors governance training, just a one-dayer. Um, we used your funding um, to support that. Um, and so I think there's more opportunities to be doing those kind of things. Um, at the end of each year, we put a survey out to our member groups asking what training they want. Governance is one of those um, line items that they can select. Um, but, yeah, I think it's definitely an area that we could look at more. You know, we've talked ourselves. We've just taken somebody quite young onto our board who's looking at starting to lead one of the member groups. So she wanted to come to us for some governance training. Um, and I think there's definitely room and, and a need to do more of that. Councillor White. Take the crease you. while you can. Yeah, Kilda, thank you for, uh, both for your presentations. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, I want to just support Councillor Shirley and Councillor Crosby around ground up work and, uh, and appreciate the, the heavy volunteer uh, load that you carry. Um, I want to just pick up on what Councillor Crosby said in governance and decision making and planning. Um, I would certainly like to see um, uh, encourage uh, even to participate at that level. And I know that it is quite challenging to get them. But like Councillor Crosby, I'm, I'm happy to, to support and, and see if, uh, if we can garner some interest at that level uh, for our iwi um, to participate in the governance and decision or the planning side of things as well. Um, so great to see them on the ground. They're, they're coming through, but really, really would like to support them at the, at the decision level as well. Councillor Von Dardelson. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. And this is really a bouquet to, to the, both of you and your organisation. Uh, I chair the Kauperero Valley Rotary Trust, uh, which works with as a member of your organisation. And I have to commend you on the work that you're, you're doing by putting your staff, helping us in our pest management um, so that it's properly coordinated. Within our group, there are lots of, um, there are four different rotary clubs doing different, so it's, they're all working independently, and you actually are, have proved to be a really good oil to keep the thing working co um, collaboratively. So um, um, there's good lessons learned at early days. We're really enjoying our relationship with you, and, and just want to put on record um, that we appreciate the work that you're doing for groups like ours. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> oh, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Julian. Your Jobs for Nature Cadet Programme. Can you just give us an update on how that's going? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're into intake seven. Um, we had to cancel yesterday and today for the first time ever. Um, but yes, going really well. Um, we're still getting around about 45 applications per intake with 11 spaces. And that the only advertising we're doing is a Facebook post and a local media release. Um, we're seeing a real increase in um, Tangata Whenua engagement, which is awesome. Um, so eight of our 11 on this intake um, are um, 
Māori, and many of them also are um, affiliated to some of the new hapu-led projects in the Manaki Kaimo Mamuku project. So we've got a real sort of connection has built now um, with Manaki Kaimo Mamuku Trust. Um, and we're still sitting at around about a 75% success rate in employment into the environmental conservation on the other side. So I guess my question will be whether that level of re-employment is as high as the Jobs for Nature initiatives start to fall off, because we've got, you know, many projects will be ceasing funding um, next year. Um, but yeah, at the moment, um, it's going really well. You know, I mean, we have started the process of trying to find, you know, we, we realise we need to keep it going. We can't just let it stop so that we need to start finding the funding because middle of 25, I think, is 20, middle of 24, actually, is it? Middle of 25. 20, middle of 25, it stops. But, you know, it takes quite a long time to build up that sort of level of funding. So we're, we're taking steps in that direction already. So Julian and Michelle, on behalf of uh, the council, thank you so much. Just reflecting, Julian, a twinkle in your eye how many years ago to actually make uh, wonderful use of community uh, in terms of volunteer capacity and look at what you've achieved together with your marvellous general manager and everybody else. So thank you so much. Madam Chair, I need to thank you for that introduction. <laughs> to Andy Stokes <laughs> on his last day as, as land manager, temporary land management officer. That kicked the whole thing off. Thank you. Uh, thank, yeah. thank you very and much. Now, thanks again for your support. Thank, thank you. you. Um, to Mary and Laura, uh, you were scheduled to be next, but as per as norm, we're running a little bit behind, and Dean and uh, Professor Battersall are on a bit of a time uh, constraint. Are you okay if you... You're wonderful. Thank you. We will remember you. So, um, Dean and um, Professor Battersall, wonderful to see you both. Uh, gosh, what a an interesting uh, report. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Councillors, and thank you, Madam Chair, for accommodating the um, request for a set time. Um, so this item is an opportunity for uh, the Bay of Plenty Aquaculture Group to present this uh, stock take report to councillors and to talk to the uh, future development of um, the region's aquaculture industry. Um, joining us today um, are members of the group's management committee. Uh, hopefully online, I have Graham Coates, who's the chair of the group, uh, Peter Vitasevich, who's chief executive of the Whakatauhia Muscles of Hauriki Limited um, outfit down in Potiki, and obviously Professor Chris Battersill from uh, Chair of Coastal Science at the University of Waikato, I think it's uh, known to, to all councillors. Uh, so today's presentation will be led by Graham uh, with support from Peter, Chris and myself. Uh, just one note that within the slides we've got um, a map which represents some spatial planning and future timeline. There's some very small text in that, um, but the, the purpose of those is just to show the uh, like a visual representation of the um, the developments. Um, those slides are actually in the in the report um, council report itself, pages 71 to 74, I think. If councillors do want to read that detail, uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Graham to kick us off. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank, thank you, Dean. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, we are not going to take a lot of your time because we'd rather you asked us questions. So I'm going to push through pretty quick and leave the speaking mainly to uh, your two uh, local representatives there, uh, Chris and Peter. So I know you've already got the stock take of agriculture opportunities in the Bay of Plenty and Dean's excellent report on the, the progress of what was the RAO starting back in, or the Regional Aquaculture Organisation, starting back in uh, 2009 and 10. Um, I'd like to, firstly, personally, I'd like to thank uh, both the Regional Council and the Bay of Connections for their uh, wholehearted support of both groups um, from the inception of the Regional Aquaculture Organisation. Uh, I've been involved in aquaculture development in most regions of New Zealand. And I can tell you without a doubt, uh, working with the Bay of Plenty Regional Aquaculture Organisation and previously REO uh, has been one of the most positive and, uh, and uh, 
I would say, enthusiastic aquaculture groups that I've ever worked with. And I'd like to thank the council again uh, for their rules around aquaculture development in the Bay of Plenty. Um, we will continue to look for your support going on in the future. Uh, as I said, we've got a short time today with a lot to cover. So I'm, I'm going to give the speaking of the slideshow over to Peter, uh, who you all know from Whakatauia Muscles Limited uh, and uh, previously Chairman of Aquaculture New Zealand. So um, Peter, are you able to take over now? And I think Dean's going to work the slides. I, I must apologise that we can't be there with you today. Um, it's obviously very different in your part of the world from down here in Blenheim. So uh, with no further ado, Peter, can you take over? Uh, th thank you, Graham, um, Kia ora, um, Madam Chair and, and Councillors, um, and I uh, endorse Graham's comments and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, showcase uh, the opportunities of aquaculture in our region. Um, as on the first slide, um, aquaculture happens in the region, so it's not something that is created around cities. Um, it's, it's a development that currently happens uh, in the regions. It's all water-based and it's, it certainly does um, have a positive effect on small towns. Uh, for um, the, our aquaculture industry, uh, we do farm fantastic seafood. It's uh, mussels, oysters and salmon. Uh, we're all managed under what we call the A-plus system, um, which is our management framework, which is a joint venture between uh, industry, uh, WWF and Monterey Bay in, um, in the US also uh, plays a part in, 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 in managing our industry. We all have audits every year and um, it's all external. Um, we've just, for our company, we've just had our last, our audit for 22, and uh, that was uh, carried out by a Australian company. So we employ about 3,000 people, and here you see a, a map of New Zealand, and it sort of outlines where you look at Auckland, uh, Northland, oysters and mussels are, are growing. Um, Coromandel, and you come down through uh, Marlborough, which is the heart of our industry. Um, the numbers there are, are really uh, percentages. And you look at the Bay of Plenty, uh, right now we don't really, um, we're at probably about 1% or 1.5% of the industry. Uh, by 2030, uh, it is the plans that will be probably 10 10 to 15 percent of the New Zealand industry. On the left hand side uh, you'll see uh, we'll focus on mussels because that's traditionally what we'd be growing here. Our waters are too warm for salmon. Now um, we industry grows around 95,000 tonnes. Uh, the bulk of it is export revenue. The interesting thing though when you look at the salmon figures um, we are a country surrounded by water. We've naturally been brought up uh, eating fish and catching fish. But you look at salmon, uh, export revenue of 148 million, but domestics 150. And, and to me, that's always a telling tale uh, when we're sur surrounded by water, um, how big a part aquaculture does play. Okay. So the industry, um, we the bulk of it is frozen half shell, uh, around 63% of the export earnings. But if you look at number two, muscle oil, and uh, number five, muscle powder, that is really going to be the future of our industry um, going into pharmaceuticals. Um, currently, um, the bulk of our product is, is sold for human consumption. But if you look at uh, probably in the next 10 or 15 years, they, that will change and new, uh, pharmaceuticals will play a bigger part uh, in the use of our product. Uh, our biggest market is, China, is uh, the US. But if you look at the Asian countries, China, Korea, Hong Kong, um, Asia play is probably the biggest market 
as a collective, but the USA is and has always been the, the bulk of uh, the New Zealand industry. And uh, so in our area um, and as a collective, right now there is the oyster farms at Ahiwa and currently our, our current farm which is in, in the middle of the, the map there, uh, the 3,800 consented area. But what, ha what is happening is that um, the, our region has been recognized as, as really the growth of aquaculture for the next 10 or 15 years. That's been alluded in the report that you've got. Um, and it's also uh, been highlighted by MPI and the Crown um, in their ambitions to have a $3 billion industry. The interesting part about our region is that uh, it's going to be iwi and aquacultures is, is really going to uh, drive the growth. You've, you've got the current participants of uh, Whakatauia um, in, in, in that area and now Whanau Apanui uh, getting involved by creating the Muscle Spat Hatchery but also uh, will be uh, lodging applications for further marine space. Now, that obviously two iwi organisations. Now, when, when marine space is created um, as part of the aquaculture settlement uh, with, between the Crown and iwi, 20% of um, marine space is automatically allocated to, to iwi participants. And, in this case, uh, for our region, uh, the 12 iwi, uh, well, actually, I might not have that quite right, but the iwi of uh, Moana, uh, Team Moana Toy, uh, will be participating in aquaculture. So currently, this work um, has been driven by, uh, by Tokim, uh, working with MPI, and with uh, the iwi of, of the region as a collective of identifying where the marine space will be. Um, and it, it will be all focused down at the uh, Poriki Tikaha, the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Uh, as you work, go to the west, uh, there is one area there that uh, we're highlighting, but because of the spatial planning and the no-go zones with shipping and um, uh, areas like that, the Eastern Bay is really going to be where everything's going to be situated. And it's driven by uh, Whakatauia, Whanau Apanui, but also the 20% uh, the of settlement space for iwi. So iwi, iwi will be driving it. Um, there is a aquaculture settlement group uh, which is made up of, um, uh, I actually privileged to sit on that with uh, participants, uh, other iwi participants, and we're working with MPI, with the Crown and Tokum to actually bring the settlement home. The long-term vision for our, our um, for iwi and for everyone involved in aquaculture is to be... Uh, the, the food bowl that feeds the world. Now, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, this is something that we, as, as a business uh, and our community have put together, but the long-term vision for aquaculture is really bringing together iwi hapu, the community, industry, central government, local government, and the research providers as one, and that is where we say we are one hand in hand to actually grow an industry uh, that hasn't been in a region before. And really, uh, I think that's where the, the difference of our organization and the, um, you could say the enabling of our council um, to, to try and work together to create an industry and really when you look at the benefits that it does bring regions, I think creating an aquaculture industry is going to be really good for everybody in the future. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, very, Peter. Very fast and a lot more detail behind it.
No, absolutely fascinating. Thank you and Graham very much. I'll just um, ask Dean. Dean, do you and Chris want to add now to this presentation? Because I'm sure you're going to be inundated with questions. Um, I'll let Chris speak to anything. I'm very much here as a conduit to these gentlemen. So. Kia ora tate. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. I just um, wish to yeah, support Peter and, and Graham for the leadership that they've shown, uh, and Dean, of course, for assembling this, this magnificent vision document. Um, I'd just like to add that um, with Toya Hamai um, and uh, Awanuirangi, we're combining to, I think, uh, provide the, the backup plan mindful of, of a shifting climate um, and some of the environmental considerations. Uh, Rikarangi Gage and others um, have uh, a rahira here, have um, thumped the desk and says uh, everything we do has to be sustainable. So we've been fortunate um, in gathering a, a, a science collective and we've been successful with winning um, over $10 million, if you include um, GST from MB, in addition to a Vision Mataranga um, grant through to the whanau out at Rokokiri, to have a look at um, the longer term sustainability and water quality, particularly around the coasts. So this is uh, cognizant of a shifting climate, cognizant of what we're seeing now, sadly, um, rivers running high, uh, delivering a lot of sediment. And so there's concern about uh, the backdrop in terms of the environment that these offshore farms uh, are engaging in. In addition to that, um, along with Toa in particular, uh, there's a, a background of research on new species targets with a mind to intergenerational opportunity. Um, we're using that, of course, to train uh, the future generation of scientists and aquaculture um, professionals, um, and including things like um, tohira, surf clams, kura, um, blue nose, flounder, you name it. It's, there's a pipeline of work coming up that uh, many of those things will uh, likely be um, suitable for integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, uh, that means a number of species which are compatible, um, they live better off one another, uh, they ameliorate uh, ocean acidification, if you like. So that uh, backdrop of research effort is now well and truly underway. Thank you. Well, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Right, councillors, I have Councillor White, Councillor Shirley, Councillor Scott and the Chairman and Councillor McMillan. Right, Councillor White. Yep, kia ora. Thanks for the presentation. I'm really interested in in the iwi-led uh, aspects of this. Um, uh, I'm, I've been hearing quite strongly from uh, iwi across the board, from Takatoa here through to Tiarua, about the need to be leading this out in a sustainable way. So I can understand what Ricky Rangi said about hammering the table about sustainability and doing it the right way. So, I mean, from that perspective, um, how, how connected are you? Because I understand that there is an iwi grouping or collective already there talking amongst themselves from Whakato here right through to Te Arua. Um, Are you aware of that group? And, and I'm assuming you're, you're, that you're participating in that particular conversation at this stage? Absolutely. Um, we work very closely and, and Chris is doing a great job leading um, that, that part of the growth of, of where aquaculture can be in, in, in the future. And he's also, um, we've got two work streams going on. One is bringing home the settlement. And um, Chris actually works with, uh, with us, with Bill, uh, Evra, Danny, Lachlan, uh, Dickie, Ruben from uh, Natiawa. So we're, we're Ricky uh, and Chris, we're all together on this working group to bring the settlement home. And we're using the work that Chris is doing, which is um, really the opportunities side of it. Mm. And then we're using our business as uh, what's actually happening. So as a collective, um, we're looking to bring uh, iwi aquaculture home through the settlement and to create a, a, a big industry in our region. No, thank you for that, because I'm very much aware that, um, you know, from the production side of things, the growing side of things, the production, the processing part of things, and then the trade extending out and opening up some yeah. trade portals is the conversation that I'm aware of that's happening. So it's really good that you're linked into that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Shirley. Uh, yes, Peter, uh, during our tour earlier in the year, uh, hugely impressed with what you're doing there with the Whakatoia mussels. Um, I recall from the discussions we had at the time on that day that I asked you what was your biggest uh, problem and, and you outlined that the biggest problem, frustration and risk to the success was actually the unreliability of labour. 
which, which seems to be a contradiction in many ways, but, you know, we have an area with huge unemployment. Here's a big um, uh, investment opportunity to create jobs. Um, and I'm just wondering, given that it is sort of the elephant in the room, we have an area with, with huge unemployment, one of the highest levels of um, work and income support uh, in the country. So how do we break that entrenched um, dependency and disengagement and actually get a workforce that can be motivated and involved and engaged? Because um, to me, that does seem to be the elephant in the room for the success of this very laudable project. You are correct, and it, it's. It, it, I think it's a factor that New Zealand, as as a as a whole, suffers from. Um, we look currently we've, we're employing around 190 people, and we probably have absenteeism of of you know 20 to 30 per day, and. Um, but we unfortunately we always focus on the the negative, but we've still got 160, 170 fantastic people um, from our community working within the business. And um, where I see it, like we've got 22 apprentices, we've had 93 people um, pass their level two. So um, and now going to level three training. So where I'm heading with this is I think it's all about training and, and also bringing the communities together. Now, we've been working uh, uh, with uh, Whakatauia and we actually think that really we need to make the change at a young age and we're looking at... Um, trying to put together a program with, uh, in conjunction with MSD, with the colleges, and, and uh, Chris highlighted it with training of the young ones. A lot of these young ones at school, um, you know, they're at a crossroads. They can either turn left and join another organisation, which we don't want to see, or we can recognise them and then bring them through into new industries. And I think that's part of this whole collaborative manner where we all need to be um, working together to take these young ones and uh, bring that next generation through. So unfortunately, every region, every community has it. And uh, that's one of the areas that we want to start changing. Councillor Scott. Yeah, I suppose it follows a bit on um, from Councillor Shirley's question. It's about, um, so it was really exciting about the economic and employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And Chris outlined um, some of the environmental, um, you know, the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem advantages of the project. Um, so my question is really about the, the, the human ecosystem, if you like. And if, I was wondering if there's any um, research or studies being done and is what can, what, how can that part of the world be uh, you know, perhaps extra services um, in the in the town, extra um, or something about that part of the world that stops people wanting to move away from it, and um, and encourages people to stay where they they start off in life. Uh, that, that's that's actually a really good question, and um, like we're, we're production based businesses, and um, and so. Um, to do that, we need the people, and and I've never experienced this high amount of absenteeism in, in before in my whole career. So we were, have been quite fortunate. We secured funding from Bay Trust to actually uh, bring in external consultants to actually work with our team, people that have left the business, also talk around the community. Um, about what we need to do. And what's been highlighted in, in a small community like ours is that traditionally a lot of the people have always been seasonal workers. And, and so they work through a season and then go back into um, the MSD programs. And that's, that's where that's what's been highlighted. And I, I don't mean to be disrespected, but I think 
MSD have a part to play here because they are the biggest employer in all of our little communities. And so the work that we're highlighting uh, through Bay Trust, uh, through this consultant, is that really we need to try and break the cycle. It all comes down to training, uh, support for the people moving into new and, and full-time jobs, but also to highlight to the young ones that there is a career um, in all facets of the business. Mr Chairman. Oh, th thank you, Chair. Um, look, this, I found this paper interesting, and I say interesting because the aquaculture strategy has been for around for a long time, and you've all done very well, you know, whether it's um, Graham, Peter, or yourself, Chris, in terms of getting us to where we have. But I think, as you said, Chris, it's a really aspirational, visionary type document. But to me, it was really short on what are the head headwinds that Councillor Shirley referred to, what are the other headwinds that we're facing? And as an example, um, if you take some of the environmental issues that we've currently got as a nation, Big Glory, Big Glory Bay and Rakiura, um, some of the things that Peter's alluded to in the bay, um, the real challenge here, I think, is when you're dealing with, and uh, Councillor White referred to it, I think Karamea Inslee is heading up the Te Arawa, a uh, 242 strategy. The real issue here is what can we do in terms of getting fin fish development off land because the land issue, frankly, is all about a challenge with fish and game, especially in getting trout off. Mm -hmm. And the ministers know that, but no one's prepared to bring the battle to the fore. So there's that issue. And then my recollection of when we went to Port Lincoln was I think it was clean, clean seas facility mm -hmm. we went to, Chris, where there were 12 people with PhDs trying to do this work. And that refers to the comments that you made on page 45 in terms of the capacity to do R&D and move, as Peter said, to powder for muscles and all that. We shouldn't underestimate the amount of free cash you've got to deliver out of the commercial entity to make a success of that is eye-watering. So I just appreciate some commentary on where you think some of the headwinds are and how we can knock them down. Because the people sitting around managing this group, you know, Graham and the Peters and yourself, got a ton of capability there, but the reality is there's some commercial economic headwinds that we need to deal with. And can we deal with them in the time frame that we're talking about? Um, uh, kia ora, thanks for that question. Um, it might pay for Peter to go first because... The largest headwind has, uh, in our very strong opinion, has been overcome, and that's the fact that you have offshore mussel farms out there already proving the case where there was huge amount of doubt um, and scepticism in the past. Peter, do you want to speak to that, and then I can follow up with the other questions. No, and, and it's a good good point, Doug. I, I think you know we have we've actually. Even though this was a dream that was created in in 2020 uh, in the year 2000, and by the time and uh, the consenting process was finalised, it, it was still a dream. And we've actually what we've achieved between 2014 and now um, is is remarkable, and that's only been through the enablement of of bringing everyone together uh, to do it and. Um, you know, the investment with the harbour that you guys have done alongside the Crown um, and the Crown's investment, not only in, in our business, but uh, uh, other supporting areas. So where I'm sort of heading is that we've actually come a hang of a long way. Um, we've got the backbone of it, but the job isn't done. It isn't finished. And we've been having these conversations. You're right, Doug, for where we are. Uh, the, to go to the next level of uh, fin fish or um, high value products, even further development in, in, in the water here is going to take a lot of capital. And that's why that, that last slide that uh, on this, and I, I don't know, Dean, if you could go to it, it's not going to be any one company, any one person. It's going to be a collective that all of us are going to do that. And you, you're right, the elephant in the room about finfish, I sort of alluded to it, that salmon's not really workable up here uh, in our hot water, in our warm water. It's really trout. 
and and trout farming in our region is really going to be um, the, the the key driver for finfish, and it's a matter of changing uh, rules, regulations, consents, and um, it's a big 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 push, and it's going to be really driven by the crown, and it's probably going to have to be a a government that's really got. Um, a lot of balls to do it, excuse my um, analogy, because it's a big move to bring trout into the commercial arena. I don't know if I answered your question, Doug. <laughs> um, I'll just add to that. The, um, the finfish uh, issue is, is one worth, well worth tackling because a lot of the R&D um, is already on the table. Uh, and it's not just us, I hasten to add, that, that are working on that, uh, be it trout, salmon, um, or the hybrids in between them, which is an opportunity. Uh, we have two uh, salmon, internationally respected salmon experts right here in Tauranga, for instance, at the university and with Toya Hamai. Um, and we're uh, running right now a number of programs with Plant and Food and Cawthorn Institute. So everybody's uh, in, in amongst that. We personally think there are uh, lower hanging fruit uh, than trout uh, for the immediate uh, future. That's um, linking in with Niwa, of course, on their work on kingfish, um, but also uh, blue nose. Uh, we have demonstrated that you can grow those very effectively. You mentioned also the hurdles regarding pharmaceuticals. Um, Peter's absolutely right. Uh, the, the most exciting and most profitable future is going to be in those. And this country is well linked internationally in that program. We've had the highest success rate out of any from marine natural products discovery linked to the National Cancer Institute in the US uh, in the world. Uh, there are two drugs out there right now uh, that have come from marine organisms, and we know of a number more. Probably um, more likely in the short term are going to be agrochemicals. Uh, we're working already with Zespri on a seaweed generator uh, PSA antibiotic, uh, and there's many others in terms of uh, glyphosate and tordon replacements that are coming up through the pipeline. So, so these are going to probably take five or so years, but the infrastructure for um, uh, purifying those compounds and, of course, moving from a hub, say, in a potiki, um, some powder is a heck of a lot more cost efficient and, and also um, more desirable in terms of a carbon footprint but then moving whole muscles, for instance, you're dealing with orders of magnitude less weight. So um, that bodes to a future, not only in terms of primary productivity in the, the blue economy out there and out in the Eastern Bay, but also some high end um, bio industry, which is likely to come uh, very, very quickly on the heels of that. So I think the prognosis is there and the, the proof of the doability of this is already on the table, I would strongly argue. Yeah, right. if, I've, if, got, I've if, got four. If I could just make a, a quick comment, um, the, the report that you've got is really the stock take. And for us as our group now is to actually, um, we've looked in the rear vision mirror. Now we want to look at the future and map out where we're we going to be and what are the opportunities uh, between now and 2030 and then between 2030 and 2050 because um, iwi and, and all of our um, investments are for the next generation. So it's a long-term plan that um, our group is really starting to, uh, or would like to put together. And that's for the aspirations of what Chris is doing and also the agriculture settlement. But I just, Madam Chair, can I just say, add to um, what Peter said um, and, and Doug, the, the holdups and the headwinds in aquaculture don't generally come uh, at the science level. Uh, it generally comes at the planning and the government's policies around the development of aquaculture mm -hmm. and, and the regionals plan, regional council's planning issues uh, or yeah, they are issues in other parts. So um, I see our, big, our, our major job as the Bay of Penny Aquaculture Group is to educate all sectors about how we can move forward without any headwinds or, or eliminate the headwinds as much as we can before we get to them. And, uh, and that, that would be very different from every other region of New Zealand where the, the issues have been foremost and the, the government and the councils have tried to tidy up afterwards. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. There are three batters to go. Councillor McMillan, Councillor Von Dardelson and Councillor Thurston. 
and Councillor Shirley, fourth man, in, and then a question from Councillor Nees. Just at this stage, again, my apologies to the representatives from EnviroHub and Sustainable Bay of Plenty. I'm sorry um, that this timing has not worked for you. My apologies, that's my problem. Um, so I do apologise to you. So, Councillor McMillan. Oh, kia ora. Um, you say in your report about um, aquaculture sort of moving into a future which enhances the life force of the environment as well as its people. That's quite aspirational. It's great to hear about your sort of on-land replacement products. How do you, you know, because you hear about the horror shows in Scotland with the salmon farms, antibiotics, animal welfare, disease, all of that. So how do you enhance the environment with these big commercial projects? Do you offset um, by sort of restoring another area um, in lieu of what, what's created by having that farm there? Or, yeah, how does that work with enhancing the environment? Um, I, I can yeah, start yeah. By, by answering that question and you can take over. Um, from my very early days in aquaculture when I was a, a marine biologist, I was really concerned with the with the take of fish and seafood from the sea and and also more recently the the runoff from land and the effects that has on the natural resources in the ocean and i've always had a sort of upfront view that by farming fish and reducing the amount of take in the ocean and also ensuring that the seabed stays uh, in the state it's at at the moment or better um, aqu aquaculture is, is enhancing all of that uh, through satisfying what humans want to take out of the sea. Chris, probably. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So it's, um, it's, enha it's enhancing the productivity of the marine system. And it, uh, with offshore aquaculture, it's in doing it in a way that doesn't in any way um, uh, disrupt the natural ecosystem and around the coast. And when you're speaking with uh, about algal aquaculture, which is likely to be burgeoning as well, you're also mitigating the effects, at least locally, um, of uh, an acidifying ocean because they absorb carbon. So there's, there's a clear, um, both small scale and very large scale advantage in terms of carbon footprints, enhanced productivity and re returning to the Moana, particularly in the near shore coastal zone, a lot of that productivity which has been lost. Because we're seeing, unfortunately, and around the world, and particularly in temperate regions, a demise of rocky reef ecosystems. 85% of Australia's kelp forests have now gone uh, through the warming of oceans, um, urchin outbreaks and sedimentation unfortunately. So that's that's an opportunity uh, there. The, uh, the other thing too, of course, is that um, uh, you're generating, I think, um, for iwi in particular, as I'm told, um, that you're enhancing, I guess, the life force of, of that um, oceanic domain, uh, which has been somewhat compromised. Yes, indeed, it's a little bit of an offset, um, but it's creating something which, as I say, hasn't existed before. So Bon Donaldson. Thank you, and thank you all for your presentation. I think it's exciting to, to think that we have an industry that's 675 million today with the potential to go to 3 billion. We know there's challenges towards that. It's interesting. My question has partly been answered by Chris already. Uh, Chris, when I met you first in the early 2000s, you were really excited about um, uh, the marine based. Uh, um, pharmaceutical development and the potential there, and and you you actually have touched on it. So uh, I'm you know I'm really excited that you haven't lost um, that vision, and it sounds like it's moving fast as well. Um, so I don't really have a question since you answered it so well before, Councillor Shirley. Uh, yes, um, Peter, I'm, I'm hugely passionate about the opportunity for trout farming, very interested in your presentation uh, in that regard. Um, it, it, you're quite right, it's not technical, it is uh, political. Uh, I had a private member's bill back in the late 80s to uh, introduce trout farming and allow the sale of trout fish. I was ordered by Cabinet and the Prime Minister to withdraw it at the point of the select committee um, because of the backlash of old men and chest waders. Uh, and it was huge, don't ever underestimate it, but there's no logic uh, in it. Um, what my question is, 
Is it the farming of brown trout, salmo trutter, or the rainbow trout, the Orionchus genus, which is the preferred species? Because as I understand it, trout actually converts protein a lot more efficiently uh, than salmon. I can answer that, Peter, if you want to. Yep. yep. Um, look, it's pretty simple. Rainbow trout are more tolerant to higher water temperatures and brown trout are uh, generally found in, in more southern parts of New Zealand and colder water temperatures. So mm -hmm. we, were, and that's we were looking at the Bay of Plenty in both freshwater and seawater. The temperature regime is just about spot on for rainbow trout. That, that's very interesting because um, taxonomically, globally, uh, the Orionchus genus, which is rainbow trout, is actually not a trout. It's been classified, I understand, as a salmon, and yet we allow salmon farming. But in New Zealand, we have a special thing. Uh, we allow salmon farming other than the Orionchus uh, rainbow trout species, uh, which is an absolute nonsense. You're exactly true in all that. Yeah. Yeah. It is a yeah. nonsense, and it is, it is classified as a salmon, but it's yeah. in salmon yeah. farming yeah. legal. Yeah. Uh, you're right, Ken. If you look at uh, what's been um, farmed in Australia, it is the it's it is the rainbow trout, and it's called Pacific salmon. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Mm. Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, brilliant presentation, gentlemen. Uh, I was going to raise the issue of trout about half an hour ago, but uh, I clearly hear what uh, the Honourable Ken Shirley has said and what our Chairman has said. Um, and look, I'm totally supportive of land-based aquaculture development. But um, putting on my political hat here and my other two colleagues can speak for themselves, but um, don't underestimate um, the veracity here in this neck of the woods around this issue. It's incredibly polarising uh, and there are very, very entrenched views and uh, Councillor Shirley, not only old gentlemen and waders, I can assure you. Um, but I fully agree that a total analysis is needed, uh, but we've got to get community involved in this. I know it's ultimately a government decision um, and it will be legislated for, but stakeholder engagement is critical. But please don't underestimate, uh, this is another issue, as I mentioned in a previous conversation, uh, it's akin to fluoride in this neck of the woods. So um, just be warned, everyone. Yeah. You are so, correct. Um, just quickly, you are correct in what you've said, and and in, and I think that's uh, why we need to plan for the future, and whether it's ten or fifteen years away. Uh, but right now, we need to focus on what we've currently got, what we can do, and and turn that into reality, and export earnings and employment. And I think the the rest will follow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our councillor Knees has a question, but Dean, I'm simply going to ask you not to answer it now, but to take it away and then come back to us. You'll be aware that we've got a requirement to prepare a marine spatial plan. Um, so councillor Knees's question is, what's your vision uh, for how aquaculture should be provided for in that marine spatial plan and how would you like to participate uh, in the spatial uh, planning process. So if you could think about that gentleman and uh, liaise uh, with through Namuta in terms of that, I'd be very grateful. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. I've certainly learned a lot about, um, I can't even pronounce it, Councillor Shirley, so um, f fascinating stuff. Um, so thank you very, very much indeed. Well done. Congratulations. Uh, and look forward to further updates. So I'm going to move receipt of the presentation and report, uh, seconded by Councillor Scott. All those in favour, aye against and carried. Thank you again. Um, now, um, Mary and Laura, apologies again uh, for making you wait. So if you wouldn't mind coming forward and... So this is the presentation from Enviro Hub. Um, I'm sorry, Nick Gladding is also here. So look, in your capable hands, if you wouldn't mind please using the mics, um, 15 minutes, 10 for you, five for us, although with this lot, who knows, it could be 50 minutes. So um, without further ado, um, over to you and thank you again for your patience.
No problem, Madam Chair. Kia ora katoa. Uh, nice to see you all again. Glad to see those of you that have survived the up, up rough weather of the last few days and congratulations uh, to, to the new councillors, some of whom I know, obviously, Ken is, is well known to many of us, but some of the new ones I haven't been with for, and obviously Kat is known to us as well. So congratulations, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot. I've just learned that rainbow trout's Trout and fact specific salmon, which I've eaten many times and had no idea they were one and the same fish. So you see, everywhere you go, you learn you learn a little bit. Um, I haven't got much to say to you today except to, to acknowledge, as we always do, that you have supported EnviroHub for a very long time. And no needless to say, we are, are very grateful and um, of that assistance. And to say that we now have co-chairs at uh, Hub. I'm co-chairing with Jeff Cannum, who would have been here today, but unfortunately this weather has stranded him in Japan with a little hope of getting back apparently before March. So I don't know whether Jeff regards that as a good thing or not, but that's that's where he is. And perhaps another little, little bit of information I could pass on to you is that there was some conversation previously about um, NGOs and good governance, particularly not-for-profits, and you should know that that Social Link is funded by both TET and Bay Trust to deliver um, governance training for everybody in the not-for-profit sector, so you don't have to be in the social area and obviously inspiring communities. So there's, if, you, if people are looking for that um, sort of governance, they don't do it in one day. They have series of eight sessions that, that, that you can participate in, either online or in person. So that's actually funded by the local philanthropic tropic organisations to make sure it happens. So I'd like to introduce to you Laura, our, our um, CE from Virohub, and Nick Gladding from Shift CX, who is uh, do, working on something we want to present to you today that we've been working on for a little while. Kia ora koutou. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm from EnviroHub. We're one of 18 environment hubs around Aotearoa. Uh, we're all independent um, and we just turned 21 in August. So we've been, we're one of the oldest environment hubs. Um, we've got about 14 different projects and programs and initiatives that we're working on. Um, and yeah, we have pretty good reach within our um, community um, through our social media we're reaching sort of 220,000 unique views um, during sustainable backyards which we sort of see as our gateway drug um, people often come to environment um, some of those events and then that's their first step on their sustainability journey so we're all about how we can reach as many people as we can um, with our messages and just getting them to take steps doesn't matter how small that step is but we know that it will lead to another step and another step and collectively that will have a big impact so our planet is warming and as a result our climate is changing dramatically and possibly quicker than we had first thought it's affecting us all in some way in this recent weather um, is testament to that some of bay of plenty's biggest challenges as a result of climate change are definitely going to be around sea level rise and the mitigation adaptation quandary and how we will manage and manage retreat both physically and financially the bay of plenty region is largely coastal and as you know there's a lot of coast to manage our region is also hugely reliant on horticulture, and so any changes to the current climate are likely to adversely affect the kiwi fruit and avocado industries. With more heavy rain events expected, increased coastal erosion and inundation and with sea level rise, but with, with also more drought events predicted. There could be significant changes to the crops that will be able to be grown within the region, and it is anticipated that kiwi fruit will be particularly impacted by warmer winters. This has the potential to have a huge impact on a region where horticulture is an important part of the local the likelihood of warmer, wetter conditions could also increase the risk of invasive pests and weeds that could decimate this industry sadly relatively quickly. In terms of the marine environment and the biodiversity within it, there is the impact of changes to water temperature, etc., that alters what survives and thrives. Transport is a big issue for the region, with it being responsible for a large chunk of our CO2 emissions, and so an area where there is potential to reduce this figure. Also within the region, there are many low-lying marae and orapa. These ancestral lands are at risk of increased inundation and erosion events and will eventually be underwater as sea level rises. Māori will be disproportionately affected by the impacts of, impacts of climate change, whether it be through loss of jobs and industries, but also as a result of location of housing or quality of housing. Houses that are poorly insulated and prone to damp will require more heating in winter and more cooling in summer. 
There are also the issues associated with loss of marae and ancestral land and homes, and the likelihood that other family members could be forced to move away. <clears throat> Ability to gather kai will also be affected, affected by the impacts of climate change. Central and local governments need support to reach their commitment to addressing this climate emergency and significantly reduce our carbon emissions. Um, climate change is a key issue which is exacerbated by people's apathy and disconnect from nature. We need to halt the decline of our natural environment now and regenerate. We do know that the doom and gloom message doesn't work, and some of you are possibly thinking, I oh, hear the environmentalists talking about the end of the world. Um, fear leads to apathy and inaction, even if people say and think that they care. Instead, we want to keep messages positive. The changes that we promote are not just about reducing our climate impact, but they will also give us a greener, healthier, wilder and more resilient region to live in. And what's not to love about that? Small changes that individually seem minor all add up over space and time to make large differences. It's not a central or local government responsibility. We all need to make a positive impact collectively. Making our urban spaces greener, more biodiverse and cooler during heat waves with the region better at managing water. And in these times of rising inflation, developing people's skills in food production increases food security and sovereignty and enables people to ride some of these price hikes, as well as accessing healthier produce too. And it builds resilience at a street and a community level too. Kia ora. Um, I'm Nick. I am the designer working uh, with EnviroHub. Um, and we have come up with an answer that we feel um, is uh, in direct response to all these um, issues that Laura has been uh, outlining in the region. Uh, so we, we, we came up with the idea of an app um, that people can use um, as a, a gateway into um, their environmental effort. Um, the, uh, the app is called The Green Team, the whole idea being that um, individual effort together makes a huge impact collectively. Um, and we want we want to help people um, take that first step or second step or even you know many steps down um, and and bring them um, through the whole ecosystem um, that has been developed through EnviroHub um, and this is the way you know people will ease into it. So uh, you know people have to make changes in order to uh, to make a, an environmental impact. Um, I think as Laura alluded to the, the apathy that people have tends to be around, oh, well, the greenies are just sort of shouting, um, you know, all this doom and gloom, I feel helpless. But this is uh, there to show them that they're not helpless, that there are tiny things that they can do that will, um, over time, collectively make a big impact. Um, and as, uh, as Laura um, alluded to as well, um, once you've taken that first step, it's really easy to take the second step and, and so on and so on. Uh, and we want a, a way for people to... Uh, that, um, but also be able to carry it through. Um, the whole idea of this was to gamify um, or make um, make fun or interesting the process. Um, so we came up with the idea of monthly themed challenges. Um, this all ties into initiatives that are through the EnviroHub network. Um, so people will not only be able to learn what they can do um, within their own home, but they can also learn what, uh, what activities are happening in the region that they can join, meet other people who are interested in, um, in taking their steps toward being more environmentally conscious and aware and actually doing something practical to make an impact. So one of the big things um, that we uh, that people have to be able to do this is to be able to learn what it is that they can do. Um, so with the monthly th theme challenges, uh, it, it gives uh, people the ability to engage. Um, as you can see here, um, we keep we're keeping it really simple. This is the first view of the the app um, that we've developed. At this stage, it's at an MVP level. It's it's been designed. Um, we have uh, we have scoped the um, build um, from a technical level, um, but at the moment, um, you know, we want to we want to take a lean approach and design it um, for a very uh, simple start, um, where things are uh, maybe um, you know a lot more on the lighter level. But as we learn um, and, and test this, we will be able to gather information that can help us actually put out something that people are engaging with. Um, so as you can see, 
Um, this is a, a theme month we've, we've just chosen transport. However, this is only one month um, in the whole year. Uh, the themes are based around that time of year, what initiatives are happening through in the EnviroHub network. Um, we want to give people information that they can use, um, whether it's bus timetables, cycle lanes. Um, a lot of people don't even know that they can go on the council website and see where the cycle lanes are. Um, a lot of people don't know how to recycle properly, whether how they wash their recycling. Um, it's all basic stuff, but the, um, this is just a simple way for people to get little bite-sized pieces of information. It's not overwhelming. Um, it's fun. You know, it could be as simple as biking to work one day this month. That could be your start. So uh, you've seen the dashboard and you've seen how people would get into the app. Um, we want to also offer information. Um, this is where you've got the, um, the bike lanes. Um, we also want to, uh, when someone's completed a challenge, um, you know, give them a, a points scale for that challenge. So if it's an easy challenge, um, they perhaps get one point. If it's a difficult challenge, like starting your own event, um, you could get three points. That all goes towards a monthly prize. You go in the draw to win a monthly prize that's related to that uh, initiative that month. Um, it could be anything from during tra transport month. It could be an electric scooter during, um, during say, uh, what was what was one of the other ones? Yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah you, you could you could go in the draw to win um, uh, you know a system for dealing with your waste better, um, something of that nature. Um, the idea is that. Uh, people will be able to not only see their own, their own individual impact, but as you can see on that centre screen, they can see the collective growth that's happening. And we want to make it really simple and visual and uh, visceral so that people can understand, okay, you know, my little individual effort um, has actually, with everyone else's collective effort, added something pretty pretty big. Um, another big thing is with the EnviroHub events that are coming up each month, um, you can um, have access to what's when those are, um, what's happening with them, um, who might be involved. And then also um, you can find out what, what prize is up for the draw that month. The idea not being that um, people need a prize to necessarily do something, uh, you know, um, more environment uh, environmental space but that um, it is an incentive for those people who might need a little bit of a nudge um, I know myself um, and others uh, you know you, you just feel good um, when you make changes that are, are positive um, so so um, green team will provide a gateway to environmental efforts within our region monthly themes give users a focus guiding them on a journey to take affordable practical steps to live more lightly and raising awareness of community initiatives and events so they have awareness of these initiatives and can, and can be part of the community to scale impact with more people and doing more to move the needle we will reach critical mass sooner and be in a better position to turn the tide for everyone's benefit Green Team is a region-specific way for people to take action. It's aligned with regional councils' four goals for climate change and supports current initiatives by councils such as Live Lightly and Genless. Engagement and education is key to us reaching the necessary targets around reducing our, emission, our, our emissions, and the app will enable us to scale awareness for government and council-led initiatives like the Sustainable Home Schemes and other initiatives encouraging us to reduce our footprint and adapting to our changing climate, and is intended to support um, councils' community engagement delivery and the statement that we all have a role to play in building a better future for the next generation. Superb. Is that you? Or um, well, no? we just we just wanted to talk. One more slide. Yeah, we <laughs> wanted to talk a little bit how we we are supporting your your mahi. Um, so uh, one one thing that's important uh, for this is we we want to make it. Uh, we you know we know that this is uh, region specific. A lot of the issues here are region specific, although um, you know global. Um, we uh, we also align directly with your four goals um, toward uh, climate change. Um, we we understand that and we support that, and this has been very much designed um, with the same um, uh, the same momentum. Uh, 
we uh, we support your current initiative, so we can we want to link to other initiatives that are happening as well. We don't want it to necessarily just be within the um, the EnviroHub network. However, that is the main driver for this, um, being that you know uh, everything is uh, within that monthly theme. It's uh, it's supported. People have that. Uh, they have the ability to, to do more within um, that, that themed month. Um, this uh, scales awareness for all your council-led initiatives, um, like the Sustainable Home Scheme, um, and it supports uh, council um, and community engagement. Um, we know it's, it's hard sometimes, the, the ears aren't necessarily open, so we're trying to um, help um, you know, um, amplify what, what's already been done, the great work that's already been done. Um, another um, important thing is we just wanted to let you know what we've achieved so far, which I've touched on. So the app is in development. Uh, we we have signed off the, it is, uh, the technical scope. Um, it is uh, our MVP, which is minimum viable product, has been designed. So we're ready to, um, to get going on that. Uh, we, we have the future possibilities uh, mapped out. Um, we're building relationships and we're testing concepts. Um, so the future goals uh, is to um, obviously build um, and launch the app. Uh, we're gonna start out within the uh, Tauranga Moana region. The idea is that we're get, gathering good information so that we can then uh, learn how to grow it in the way that uh, people want to engage with. Um, and we will go region wide. Um, we we, we want to uh, gather feedback, obviously, um, and, and spend the energy where it's where it's really mattering. Um, online marketing is going to be a really important part to this, both free and ideally paid. Um, we a, a huge thing for us is that we want to consult with Ewe because one of the future possibilities is that we can uh, figure out how Ewe can use this um, as an Ewe specific version of this to help their community uh, communities um, within the region. Um, we want to build our database so that we can learn more um, within the region. And we want uh, also a business version so that people within uh, the corporate community can scale these efforts uh, and, and get, you know, get some momentum going within their teams. Um, the idea with this is to gain, gain a critical mass sooner. You know, uh, we all know plastic bags, there was a critical mass that happened and all of a sudden, you know, it was not okay for stores to provide plastic bags. People would buy, either bring their own bag or buy a reusable bag at the store. Uh, we think that that could happen for, um, for all these environmental efforts. Um, and this not only adds um, to our initiatives, but, um, it, it, you know, it's a win-win. So, you know, I think this, this is just a tool, a tool and our part of our, our journey to get every individual to be able to think about the future in terms of their connection with nature and the way they use um, resources. And one of the things that I think we've come to the conclusion was is that 85% of people in New Zealand now live in cities. Mm -hmm. And it's we in cities who have lost our connection uh, with nature. We're the big consumers. We drive demand in the rural areas as well. And I think if we ever want to get to be serious about climate change and to have the power as communities to support government and the sort of innovative thinking it needs to take on in order to actually meet our challenges with climate change, then we need to change the way people behave in cities. And that begins, I think, at a very grassroots level. As Ken said, that's always the place to start. And very simple things that you can do, which collectively actually change the way you think and that change in thinking gives gives you the government power to act because basically governments are reactive, or well, generally they're reactive, and what they need is a, is a base that actually says to them, this is okay to do. That's our task going forward in the next in the next few years is to actually make sure that happens. So here's a challenge to you. If you still use Glad Wrap, stop using it. You'll see how easy it is to manage with other, that just one tiny little thing. If you're getting careless about using your, your food bins, if you have food bins, rethink using them. Because if you don't put that stuff in there and it goes down the incinerator, it makes a whole lot of sludge that councils then have to dispose of at a huge cost. All of those things are really simple to achieve. But people in communities and towns forget that there's reasons why we do things. They just do things and they forget 
why you're doing it or how you're doing it and what the effect of, of is outside just that simple one act. So there's lots of things like that that I think you can change, and this is a tool which can actually help with that and the work that Envirohub's Enviro been doing for the last 20 years. We are a region-wide organisation, as you know. So thank you for the opportunity, so, Paul. Oh, thank you um, very much indeed. Now, open to councillors. Can I just say that we are running very behind now? I don't want to stop your questions, but I'm conscious that we've got Glenn and Denise um, sitting there. So uh, over to um, questions, Councillor McMillan. Thank you so much. So great to hear about that tool. Um, we've actually got a pilot about to launch called the Future Fit Tool. And what I'm really interested in learning is how they can complement each other. Um, I know um, I know our one is has got a business focus as well. Um, I don't know much about it yet, and we're going to hear more about it today. But um, yeah, I suppose we don't want to, um, um, you know, sort of do you know duplicate something. We want to actually enhance, and yeah, that's what I'm interested in learning. You won't have the answers today, but just a heads up, there is this tool. Um, and yeah, really excited to learn how they can maybe uh, dovetail in with each other and that we can actually capture more people by working collaboratively with, with those tools. So I know you won't have an answer to that, but just, yeah, it's in, yeah. And so please um, feel free to stay and listen to the um, presentation, which I'm sure is going to be very interesting. Um, any other councillors who have a burning question? Thank you. You don't. We're obviously uh, conscious of the coffee that's um, brewing downstairs. <laughs> Can I just say congratulations on turning 21? Congratulations on the journey that you've been on. And I think, if I'm right, Mary, uh, you have been there from the very beginning, uh, like Julian. Uh, and um, I know of you fondly as the mother of Tauranga, um, with some very, very visionary ideas and some very firm. Um, ideas. So we're very fortunate that you are still at the helm of EnviroHub. Congratulations, Laura, for all that you've done. Thank you, Nick. So on behalf of the council, thank you. Outstanding work. Congratulations um, and look forward to working uh, with you going forward. So thank you. Without further ado, Denise and Glenn, again, my apologies uh, that we're running behind time. <clears throat> You have the unevitable, unenviable position of standing between us or sitting between us and coffee. Um, everyone, you'll be familiar with uh, Glenn Crowther, uh, Executive um, Director of uh, Sustainable Bay of Plenty, and with him is uh, Denise Arnold, a very well-known uh, lawyer here in Tauranga and a philanthropist uh, of some incredible renown. So thank you very much, Denise, for taking the time out of your busy day to come and present to us. So without further ado, kick in. Well, thank you very much for that, Paula. Um, and I am very conscious of being between you and the coffee because I was starting to think about coffee myself. <laughs> um, I really appreciate your time today. We have met some of you before. The purpose of us being here today is to introduce ourselves to those of you who we haven't met and so who may not know about what we do and what our role is. And I'm going to now hand over to Glenn, who actually has all of the answers to your later questions. I just put that in as well. <laughs> um, you're just getting it into the presentation, Mojin. Yeah. Trying. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess one of the things that I wanted to say, um, firstly, yeah, thank you for having us here. Um, one of the things I wanted to say was we're often asked um, about why we exist. And I think fundamentally we exist because we've had so many people say to us over the last few years, particularly when I was working for Sustainable Business Network, that there needs to be something to connect up the various areas of well-being or sustainability, the economic, social and environmental issues. I think that's probably, you know, the one thing I want to stress is that we're not just an environmental organisation, we're not just economically focused, but we're trying to work at that point where all these issues come together. So I think it gives us a huge scope, 
but we're trying to uh, hone in on issues that we see are relevant to this region, particularly uh, initially probably more to the coastal Bay of Plenty, but that's more just a, a circumstance because of uh, some of what's going on or through with the uh, sustainable charter there and so forth. But um, we, as, the, as we say up there, our, our goal is to shape sustainability outcomes through awareness, accountability, action. So it means we don't do a lot of the, um, the wonderful work that Bay Conservation Alliance does in terms of on the ground doing the mahi. We don't do a lot of the uh, broad events programs that EnviroHub does in the environmental space or some of the work that other organisations around the Bay do on social issues. But we are trying to uh, bring together, uh, collaborate with others and to work at that crucial sort of meeting point between the economy, social issues and environmental issues. Um, why Michelle had issues with the. Okay. Um, so one of the big things that we say to people is that we are independent, we're charitable trust, we're apolitical, nonpartisan, all that stuff, but particularly we're trying to look at a strategic level. So the, there's so many groups doing amazing things, but often what seems to be sort of behind it all is that there's a lack of, of a sort of systemic approach to some of these issues. So um, those of you who are aware of, of our work um, around transport, around uh, urban development, a lot of it comes back to, we just hear time and time again that people are, are sort of at the other end of it in the social sector saying, why are all these issues falling back onto community groups to solve? And they're saying it needs to be addressed upfront in the economic development planning for our communities. Grave difficulty, maybe you could <laughs> give us a thank you. Um, I do want to say thank you to the council. We've got a three-year funding agreement. We've now got three years of funding from Bay Trust and um, the other organisations mentioned up there. Um, we collaborate with a whole lot of different organisations. Maybe you could go to the next slide if we try and whiz through this a bit. Um, you can skip through that one. Um, we think we sort of highlighted what we think is, is the sort of the challenge we've got and working with councils, working with businesses, it's, it's easy to sort of break it down and just compartmentalise, but we think there's a fundamental sort of um, systemic issue here, which is a, based on a whole societal wide, um, I guess, economic model. Um, we're not trying to sort of start a revolution or anything. We're trying to actually move to what is proven to work um, in a number of places around the world, which is to move towards a circular economy, to move towards more sustainable urban development and transport, and to focus in on, on the uh, transition to a low carbon economy. It is viable, it is possible, it is a huge challenge, but we think that collaboration is the only way to do that. And so we aim to work with all sorts of organisations. We have We've had, I think, some success with, with businesses who I think are taking the lead in the Bay. And I've often quoted Trevelyan's and some of those businesses that are just chip away at doing things. And before you know it, they've actually slashed their carbon emissions. They've massively reduced waste. So it is, it's there, the models are there. But um, I think we're really lagging in some of the other issues. And, and the urban development space is the one that I'd highlight. Um, I think one of the things we've found consistently since we started a couple of years ago is that people are crying out for better engagement on some of these issues. There's a lack of information out there, so one of our roles that we see is to provide the evidence for people, whether that be for decision makers or whether that be for the, the public who are trying to make informed submissions. But I think there's also, especially in some areas of the Bay, there's just a, um, a lack of connection with communities now. And it's probably just the scale of change that's happened, the growth that has happened in this area. But we can go, and I, I often speak to um, resident ratepayer groups, to community organisations, to schools, and, and consistently there's just the same sort of thing saying we don't know how to connect with, not so much with regional council, I think it's a, perhaps not pointed in your direction, but at some of the TAs and how to actually engage deeply on these issues. So they see that there's the usual, you know, we're going to consult about a particular issue and they go through a standard process and people can write, you know, a little bit of feedback on a form, press a button, but they're talking about deep level 
uh, engagement around the core issues. And I think those of you, um, I think uh, Councillor Scott and, and um, Chair were at the Huri Marae on Saturday and I was able to be there before, before they arrived. And um, it was a youth event around climate change and just hearing the passion that those young people had and I, I wasn't there when, when they spoke to you, but I, what I got from it was they really, really wanted to engage with councils on these issues. So with, we're highlighting climate change as I would say the issue that's pressing in on this country, on the world, in terms of sustainability. And I'm always quite amazed at the lack of lack of understanding that that a lot of people in the public have around you know you get such um, extreme viewpoints expressed around whether farmers are actually the problem in New Zealand or whether they are the ones who are the only ones who are protecting the environment whether New Zealand is leading the world or whether we're actually a big laggard I think you can go to the evidence you can find out in all those issues you can get some some clear understanding of what's going on but it's captured so much by, by sort of media discussions and, and politics, but there are facts behind it. And you can you can look, um, you know, at our our net emissions since 1990, and you can just look at a graph like that. And you don't have to be that clued up on climate change to know that we are not doing well, and we have not done well. And even under the previous prime minister, we did worse than under Trump's. Uh, administration in the US in terms of actually reducing emissions. So there are some facts there that I think we really need to understand. New Zealand needs to do a lot better. And I think where the challenge is, is that who who has to take responsibility for that? And I think, as Envira Hub said, everyone does. We all individually do. But I think there's a systemic issue there where people have to make some hard decisions around where they invest and whether people really do want to have uh, a low carbon economy or not. Um, so we're saying one of the clear issue, issues that we see is honing in on Tauranga Western Bay. I guess it's, as Mary said, there's a huge urbanisation in the New Zealand society now. And so in the Bay of Plenty context, there are definitely problems to address environmentally, socially, um, and other parts of the region. But I think this is probably where the biggest focus needs to be in terms of climate change and in terms of um, the whole sort of growth growth model. Um, and it, it does strike me as very strange, and I know your staff have done some amazing work on climate change in the last three years. I want to highly commend them. I think I've worked with your staff on a number of issues around transport, around climate change, around methyl bromide, all sorts of issues, and they're fantastic to work with. Um, but somehow, in spite of all that, there's no city, sub-regional or clear regional targets or strategy to reduce emissions. And I, I just look back on the year, last few years and I think, how can we still not have that when pretty much every other part of the country has done that? And even, you know, Fakatani and Rotorua have done their part by coming up with, with district-wide targets but somehow it's just too hard for the Western Bay to do it. And I think that really, you know, it's not that I think a target is the be all and end all, but if you don't have that, you're, you're not actually telling people what direction to point into. And the reality is we've just been heading in the opposite direction of increasing our emissions in the Western Bay. And until we turn that around, you know, I think, I think we, need, we need to have a target, we need to have a plan and we need to have a different kind of um, model there around it. I think, you know, you've heard me say this before, if you've been on the council in the last term, um, and probably the ones who, uh, who are new will hear me say it again, that until we have a fit for purpose, spatial plan, and um, I guess, yeah, just, just a, a formal consultation program, process with our local communities, I don't think we'll even get to the starting line in this discussion because you need buy-in from communities to reduce emissions. And I suppose one of the things that we've done as an organisation is try to find out why people are not changing their behaviour. And 
I think it's just incredibly complex, but the first step is to actually go and talk to the people in the communities. I think your council has done the best you can around that, but I think at a smart growth level, there is a huge, huge gap there and it's, you know, it's playing out. And, and I know some of you spoke up about, um, I know Councillor Crosby and Councillor Nees both spoke passionately about uh, the smart growth forums when they were scrapped last year, but, you know, now there's no link at all with local communities. And yet these, these plans are being constantly referred to as um, the reason why we're having the types of outcomes we have. Um, it's almost like people don't have who've created these plans don't feel they've got any power to change them. But I think you don't have an overarching say on it, but I, um, I think it's really important that you express your views clearly around whether these plans are steering the Western Bay in the direction that you want as a council, because it certainly clashes with what I hear from your climate change staff in terms of what's needed to reduce emissions. So, I guess our, our um, advice to councils, to businesses, iwi, hapu, anyone who, who asks us, well, you know, what can we do to actually turn things around? It's the same advice we give to individuals, to farm out to anyone, which is to just ask the questions each time and ask, is something environmentally sustainable, socially, economically sustainable? So whether it's at a family level or at a city-wide or region-wide, I think we can look at what we're all doing now and there's always room for improvement. But I think if you look at that um, sort of sub-regional planning in the Tauranga Western Bay area, you get a lot of no's. And you get a lot of no's from consultants, from council staff. And so we really do, you know, I know it's a bit of a, um, a pointed kind of uh, discussion, but it's a strategic committee that you, you're chairing, Councillor Thompson, and, and I, I thought, well, this is the key street strategic issue that we see, which is holding back an amazing lot of progress that your council is helping to facilitate and fund across the region. So, um, yeah, I don't know if Denise might be uh, far more diplomatic and uh, <laughs> able to add, add some, some words. Uh, no, I'm going to leave you there, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our role as a trust is to engage, inform, educate based on facts. Uh, as Glenna said, we're not political. Uh, we're, we are, we're sticking with facts, but we really do want to see more engagement, more con consultation, meaningful consultation, and we want to work alongside you. We value our partnership with the council we value the relationships that we have, which is why we're here talking to you and explaining, you know, what our vision is and what our purpose is. But we do see some big gaps that, you know, sometimes we're going to be unpopular. Um, that's just how it's going to be. So I'm well, not sure if that helps. Thank you, Glenn, and for your usual um, pokers in the eye. <laughs> Presentation. I don't mean Hopefully that, un that unkindly. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't at all. But you're always very direct, uh, and as you say, evidence based. And Denise, thank you. I just wanted to point out to you that under the Local Government Act, uh, and it's actually Section 14, which sets out the principles that apply to local government. Uh, and it says, in taking a sustainable development approach, a local authority should take into account, firstly social, economic and cultural well-being uh, of people and communities and the need to maintain and enhance the quality of the environment and the reasonably foreseeable needs of future generations. The question we might all ask ourselves in local government, be it here or anywhere, is how well do we do that? And so I want to thank you uh, for bringing this issue again uh, to our attention because certainly I would have to say that the principles are very clearly set out. Everyone who's in local government should know them and we should all be able to put hand on heart and say our decision-making affords priority to these principles. So thank you for the opportunity to have a little speech from the throne. Um, <laughs> I'm now conscious that uh, we've got a few questions for you and then we are going to adjourn for a cup of tea. Thank you. Councillor Shirley.
Yes, thank you, uh, Glenn and Denise. Um, you certainly pose some very deep philosophical challenges there. Uh, one, and, and following on from the Chair's comments with regard to the obligations under the Local Government Act, you, in your presentation, you stressed there the local manufacturing of sustainable products. Um, I'm just wondering how that fits in terms, because it seems to me to lead into sort of import substitution, tariff protection, self-sufficiency, anti-free trade. And New Zealand's a trading nation, as we all realise, our whole well-being culturally, economically, socially is dependent upon international trade. Uh, how do we balance that juxtaposition of, of sort of promoting self-sufficiency, um, import substitution, tariff protection, which flows from that, with our overall well-being based on free trade and trading with the world for our social and economic well-being? A good point. I, I think I put, if I recall when I made the presentation, I put a little question mark in parentheses by that one because it was, it was more of a direction of travel which is often talked about within the sort of sustainability community saying, you know, we need to get to more local production. I think the key is life cycle analysis, looking at the costs and the carbon that are embedded into various things and probably promoting wherever possible you know, local production but not, and manufacturing, but not uh, not being naive and saying that we can sort of overturn a whole global free trade approach. And indeed, we may not want to. That may, may be better environmentally to, um, in many ways to have a lot of that. So, so I think it's the key is to just understand, for instance, and I'll, I'll give a specific example, which I hear from councils a lot, is, we, um, and again, not so much from this council, uh, which is that we can't really reduce carbon emissions from transport very easily, so we just have to rely on electric cars. But the Climate Change Commission looked at the analysis from the production of, of those cars and said at the end of a predicted, whatever it is, 25-year life of an electric car, there will still be 40% of the carbon emissions of a fossil fuel, of a, an average fossil fuel vehicle. So, um, it's not saying we should manufacture the cars in, in New Zealand, it's sort of saying look at what we can do locally, which could be manufacturing electric bus and encouraging people to make an electric bus, but but moving in the direction of, of trying to take more responsibility for an overall embedding um, of, of carbon and, and the costs, the overall environmental costs of things. Follow up on that. Um, yes, thank you. I think the life cycle analysis is the approach because um, we sort of have the food miles um, barrier that sort of Europe imposes, which superficially thinks, well, don't import New Zealand products which have to be transported across the globe. But when you do the life cycle analysis, our carbon footprint on those products delivered to Europe is actually lower than the manufactured products in Europe on, on a carbon basis. Yeah. Mm. I agree. It's wonderful. You agree. I'm sure that you two could have <clears throat> um, many conversations, which I think would be very useful. Um, any other further questions before we take this opportunity to again thank you, Glenn and Denise. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for the passion you put into your work. Uh, messages received, understood. Um, these are very wicked problems uh, that we're facing. And I think as Councillor Scott and I just reflected on um, attendance at the hui, the young person's hui uh, at Huria Murai, they were talking about uh, climate grief and climate anxiety, some very, very real issues uh, amongst all of the many other wicked uh, issues that we're facing. So anyway, thank you uh, both. Please feel free to stay. Uh, and listen to uh, particularly the climate change report and presentation from uh, Nick. So without further ado, we are now adjourned until for 15 minutes uh, and enjoy your coffee. And Thank you. hopefully our guests, do we have somewhere that they could grab a coffee? Someone will come and tell you where. Thank you.
councillors will reconvene um, by starting with <coughs> consideration of item 8.2, the operating environment report. Going to take this report uh, as read. Um, just reminding councillors that we have a workshop coming up on the 15th uh, of March, uh, where we're going to be talking about uh, legislative and other reform impacting potentially our future uh, LTP discussions. So just a reminder about that. So Namuta, I'll hand over to you for comments um, and then any questions councillors or discussion councillors might have. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, councillors, myself and Julie, uh, happy to take any questions in relation to this report. Uh, just a reminder, as a, a late item of your agenda, we will be talking through uh, your submissions on the uh, reform bills, but we are certainly happy to take any questions. There being no que uh, questions, I'm going to uh, <coughs> move receipt of the report and endorse in principle the Strategy and Policy Work Programme 2023. Seconder, Councillor Crosby, thank you. Further debate, discussion, there being none, I'm going to put that, all those in favour, aye, against, and carried. Right, now, moving on to the main event. One of the main events, climate change update. Um, Nick, and could you introduce... Well, oh, tēnā koutou everyone. Uh, so for our climate change update paper on page 87 of your agenda, we've got Nick Newman, who is our climate change program manager, and Kate Barnes, our communication partner. And Nick has just said, because the mic's not on, <laughs> we've got Jane online as well in support. And was there anyone else? Nope, that's us. Nick, uh, we're in your capable hands. Okay, thank you, um, Tanakoto um, councillors. Um, thank you for having us. Um, this paper uh, provides an update um, on national and regional activities. It also seeks your guidance on two emerging initiatives um, within the climate change program. And just for clarification, um, the, clar the climate program is reported through monitoring and operations. So, uh, in a few weeks, you'll get the full the full report on all of our um, all of our projects. This is more the the big picture and what's emerging and your guidance on that. So, uh, Chair, I'd do a quick pricey um, of the paper in terms of what's anything that's changed, updated since the paper. Take your questions and then we'd uh, yeah like your guidance on the scholarships uh, item and on uh, the future fit item. Does that sound like a good approach? Uh, okay, Jane, um, actually, if, if Jane is there, uh, is uh, going to talk to anything uh, anything new in that uh, national and regional space. Come in, Jane. Maybe she's not there. Okay, uh, I'll do that. <laughs> uh, in terms of... Um, any new things uh, and things to draw your attention to. In terms of um, the Climate Adaptation Act, in terms of we know that's um, we know that's coming, we introduced to the House um, this year. We have been invited um, with uh, Whakatane District Council MFE, would like to talk to uh, Whakatane District Council staff and us um, about uh, early thinking on that act. So um, we've been really engaged with MFE through a number of um, a number of initiatives over the last few years, and so they uh, would like to come and speak to us um, on early thinking about um, how that act shapes up. So I think that's a, an interesting and positive um, initiative we can report back to you on that will be happening in the next um, the next couple of weeks. Uh, other things um, to bring your attention to within this, and we'll take your questions and discussion. Um, uh, the Tauranga City Council Youth Climate Forum. Uh, Councillor Scott and Thompson, I attended that on Saturday, and maybe you would like to speak to that, um, either of you, in terms of reflections. Yeah, the the it was it was great. Kids are um, kids, they were, they were youth, up, um, mainly teenagers, um, and they were obviously very engaged, very interested in. And what's going to happen? I think one of the concerns was the the idea that there's um, what 
called climate change anxiety or or, or worse. And we uh, and, the, and one of the messages we got was that we've got to be careful that we don't take hope away from our young people, <laughs> and that um, that we give hope to them. And when we talk about climate change, thank you. Oh, it was tremendous, uh, as it always is when you have uh, a group of uh, passionate uh, younger people. It was interesting their perception that people like us, councillors and staff are in these sort of positions of power and that we have all of that and there was a sense of that, you know, there needs to be far more sharing around and that this is an issue, climate change, which is going to need a whole of community approach, as we've heard this morning, uh, and young people. They had some very, very interesting ideas um, and I just thought it was absolutely a fantastic initiative that was undertaken. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can, as a council, uh, engage, you know, on, in this space with younger people um, more and more. So, no, it was really fantastic, and thanks uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Those were my the key things I took away as well about that that climate anxiety and the depth of understanding of the young people. Um, Savon Dudelson? Yeah, I'd be interested... Um, that anxiety is real. Um, did was, was there any outcome in in the discussion of it as as to a way forward to to uh, prevent it from um, being overburdening on our youth? We were the, we were there at the end of the day, so um, but we asked the question and um, one of the panellists, so there was youth, so we, we got to ask questions of a panel and one of the panellists I thought answered it quite well um, about uh, recognising it and um, talking about doing what they can. I think it was, it was basically her message. Um, councillor, that, uh, we, as Councillor Scott has said, we were only there for the sort of tail end uh, of their day and they had been workshopping all day and there's going to be um, <clears throat> notes now that will be available and hopefully, um, Nick, if you think it's appropriate, can be circulated to councillors uh, because there were a plethora uh, of issues and I have to say, including uh, concerns about the Mount Monganui airshed uh, and just their depth of understanding of that issue was, was um, very, very uh, interesting. So there'll be a range of issues. Um, and so, Nick, I just ask that if and when it's appropriate, if those notes could be circulated to councillors, because there were a, a range of issues. Absolutely. Thank you. And to your question, um, Councillor Hunt Ellison, we've already spoken with our comm staff about the climate anxiety issue, and making sure we need, to, we need to have that lens across any comms that we do. So I think that's a really important takeaway from the day. Uh, in terms of um, other things that have changed since the paper, um, Councillor McMillan and I were supposed to be at Social Link yesterday for a, um, a, a climate workshop with social providers. Um, this was being run by Social Link. It'll now be next week. Um, but this, uh, we're making the connection because in the future, social providers, I think, are going to be an important part of the, the puzzle in terms of how, uh, how we respond to climate issues. Um, they're going to touch down on social issues. So that's a really important link that... Um, that we're going along to make. Uh, and further to that, uh, Tapuna Kokori have invited us to um, a meeting tomorrow about our community um, climate adaptation funding. They're very keen to link into that and learn um, how they can leverage that and support us with that process. So uh, that's some good recognition of the work we're doing um, in that space. Uh, if um, at the end of the regional local activity, um, there is a reference there to um, to smart growth, picking up on the point that was made in the last presentation to you. So uh, we have been uh, at a staff level speaking with smart growth, growth and um, really pushing um, that, number one, that climate resilient development needs to be a, a strong thread through the smart growth strategy, um, that new natural hazard information needs to shape um, future connected centres and that uh, any risks to existing centres needs to be addressed through the Tauranga Climate Action Plan, which is being developed currently. 
which the youth forum will feed into. So all these things are are starting to connect. Um, and we are, I guess we're we're pushing the messages from your climate position statement um, through those fora. Uh, there was a question, um, Councillor Thompson, you had a question about sea temperatures. Um, up on the map there, um, on the on the presentation, uh, it shows uh, current sea temperatures and the change in sea temperatures. So for the Bay of Plenty, um, there have been uh, some marine heat waves um, prior to Christmas, uh, driven by the La Nina system. So current uh, current temperatures on the left, and the I guess the difference um, in long term averages um, on the right. Uh, so the, uh, sorry, the, uh, so what it's telling us is that uh, there have been um, this summer um, marine heat waves, uh, and uh, coastal scientists believe they've been driven by um, the La Nina system. We haven't seen any indication yet in ecosystems in um, the bay, apart from the low um, occurrence of sea lettuce in terms of the warm warm temperatures driving those sea lettuce populations down. Councillor Von Darlson. Yeah, that raises an interesting question because we're, we, we seem to be having unseasonally um, at least three La Ninians in a row. Um, it's, it's historically been cyclical between El Nino and La Nina. Um, and these these storms that we're getting are getting blamed on climate change. What's the effect, uh, and I'm sure it's a combination, but what's the effect of the La Nina, El Nino um, uh, cycle on the, the, the storm, the, the warming of the currents that we currently have? I'm not going to speak outside my um, expertise. I'm not a meteorologist, but um, as I understand, this compounding with La Nina and then the cyclones, and then what I've read is that there's potentially the top 15 to 20 percent of the peak rainfall could be attributed to climate change. So it's not going to mean the cyclone's going to be there when it's not. It's still going to be there, um, but that extra peak is potentially driven by the warming of the oceans. You know, yeah. So. I my understanding is the oceans are warmer, warmer, deeper, as well. So is that is that a uh, is that a affected by La Nina or is that? Uh, it will be, and and I guess by the climate as well. So those things working together, compounding each other, and more more water is being drawn up, more energy is being drawn up into the system. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a, um, a feedback loop where these things reinforce off each other. The, um, the other item in, um, in this paper, which we're not going to present on, is the Regional Energy Transition Accelerator Program, or REAP, oops, apologies for that, which is item 3.3. .3. So this is a national um, program which has been run in Southland. Uh, it's now going to be launched in the Bay of Plenty. So this is about medium to large businesses and about identifying, I guess, low carbon um, pathways for those businesses. So Bay of Connections are partnering with ECA to kick this off in the Bay of Plenty. Uh, there's a workshop, I think there's 30 odd businesses that are gonna be involved in that first workshop um, during March. And in Southland they've developed a, like a transition program for those big businesses. And so the same will be done in, in this region. So this is a really, um, a really great way of us leveraging some of that national power and Bay of Connections connections to be able to reduce uh, emissions from medium to large businesses. Because at the end of the day, this is about drawing down or stopping those emissions from um, heading up into the atmosphere. And we can do all the talking that we like, but it actually has to be about actions that stop uh, CO2 getting to the atmosphere or drawing it down. That's uh, all I had to speak to from the paper. And then we were going to um, get your guidance um, on the two emerging issues, unless you've got any questions on um, things that I've covered. Are you presenting on future fit? Right. Well, let's kick into that, shall we, and then have a wrap yep. up. We can do that, and we've got the scholarship one. I just want to get some guidance on the scholarship as yep, well. So sure. um, we might do that first, if you don't mind, if that's all right, just in terms of the natural order of um, – is that the order? That is the order. So you've got three potential criteria. Exactly. So um, the criteria that we've put up there for um, for discussion is that 
we give preference to um, participants who um, fuck up to the Bay of Plenty. Uh, they should be in their second year of study. So this means that's a bit of quality control in terms of the, the applicants. Uh, and then what we've said thirdly is obviously they need to be enrolled in that degree. And there's a whole list of majors below. We could say we'll accept any of those majors in terms of people can apply. Uh, we could say we only want to accept majors that uh, relate to our, our core work. Um, that really is over to you in terms of if you've got specific guidance. There is one other um, scholarship directly related. This is by Tower, and theirs is focused on the data analytics, um, which makes sense for their um, for their industry. So really um, happy to get your um, guidance and feedback on, on okay. criteria. Okay, so you've got Councillor McMillan and then Councillor Scott. Um, yeah, my, my personal preference would be that the majors align with our core business. Um, and another thing, I was wondering whether there's an opportunity to, with the scholarship, get some commitment to um, being able to showcase them for our comms, you know, even if it's only a couple of times. But um, I know when I went to the Heart Foundation, when we gave out research funding, we built that in eventually. So because we weren't getting much visibility from our um, scholarships and then when we did that we were able to sort of use them in media stories social media and sort of showcase some good outcomes great thank you uh, yeah your, your headline criteria makes sense to me in terms of the majors i think the um the expertise on on what a major in a degree is lies with the Winston institution so if it fits within the degree criteria, um, for instance, you know, the the big subject area I noticed I think is missing is economics, I would. Um, economics is the study of human behaviour given increasing wants and limited resources, which is, you know, the essential problem of, of climate change. So rather than us be specific about what the majors are, if it's an acceptable major for the degree, I think we leave it to the, the professional who understand what a degree major could be to um, to set out that criteria rather than be too proscriptive, uh, prescriptive. Any other feedback? Can I just make a comment in terms of the, the, the two kind of points of view? I guess we could accommodate those with um, accepting applicants from any, um, from any major and there still would then be a process of, of interview uh, around the, the applicants. So it would just be a, a yes, you're in, if you've got a major, um, one of the climate change majors, and then how do they best align um, and how good is the applicant, I suppose, would use it at that stage. That sounds good. Take up mediation as a <laughs> career. Um... <laughs> okay, so future fit. Thanks, Jenny, if you just do the next slide. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name's Kate. I'm the communications partner here, part of the climate change team. Um, I'm going to be talking you through FutureFit, a tool that we'll be launching in the coming weeks. Um, so I've just popped up on the slide a few bits of background information to sort of set the scene um, and, and to look at where we're coming from with this project. So there's clearly a, a bit of a disconnect within our community of where they feel they could make real meaningful change within their lifestyles, um, where they can access information, and then a, a lack of understanding about where that big change is, is possible. So, for example, there's um, a big emphasis on the recycling, me doing my bit, whereas there's lots of other ways across the whole um, lifestyle choices where you could make some real meaningful change. Um, I think this also links back to the comments made about climate change anxiety. Um, there's probably almost also a feeling of disconnect or, or fatigue of there's so many big issues going on in the world. We're seeing impacts every day and more regularly. Um, and the tool from our point of view is, is great. It, it gives firstly information. So that's really powerful in itself, just letting people know what that looks like on an individual level, really easy, low stress, personal choice. So there's a a host, host of options of where you can make change versus sort of being pinholed into in a particular direction. Um, and then just loosely guided actions. Again, not a, not a huge commitment, very much for people who don't know where to start. Um, Excuse me, just jump in that um, 
this is about understanding your individual carbon emissions. So this tool is, is really focused on what emissions um, you have as an individual and then what things you can take to drive down those emissions. So very, very focused um, on that. Thanks. Um, yes, so as we've, we've seen and it's in the paper, it's a, a gamified carbon footprint tool. Um, we are, it's been in discussions for some time, but we are piloting the regional approach, which means originally the functionality was set up for this to be at a TA level. Now we are one of the first to do it at a regional level, which means we get access to that background information where we can look at trends within our community, who is participating in the tool, what their footprints look like, where they're making changes and setting action. So it'll give us some really valuable feedback. Uh, being able to take this approach means we'll be working closely with our territorial authority partners, which is great. Um, I'm already in close discussions with them and we can align our campaigns share information, share collateral, share paid media coverage. Um, so that means that it'll be really rohi wide and we'll be able to help support areas that perhaps don't have um, as much of a, a capacity to really drive a, a project of this size. Um, to touch on where this aligns with our goals and our climate change action plan. Um, so goal two with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as people engage with the tool, set actions and be able to reduce their emissions. And then goal four, really informing, getting our community engaged and, and resilient. So just to touch on the tool, um, you answer a series of questions, which I'll show you a few examples on um, as we move forward. You're then given your footprint as such, so you can um, really see where the parts of your lifestyle that you could make some really meaningful change. You can answer a second level of questions because obviously just answering the first 19, there are assumptions made about your lifestyle choices to get a more accurate footprint. Um, and then it's a real community feel in terms of you can join teams, create uh, competitions, you can challenge different people in, the organi in other organisations. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for people to engage as much or as, as less as they feel comfortable with, which I think is an important part for the climate change conversation and getting people who aren't having these discussions every day involved without feeling that pressure of, of being sort of backed into a, a corner of, of needing to make change. Um, so really simple, you head to futurefit.nz. Um, just skip straight ahead and answer a series of questions. I've just pulled out a few examples so you can get a bit of a feel for the tool, um, how you get around, how you heat your home, power consumption. Um, quite basic, straightforward questions, takes a couple of minutes. And then you are given your dashboard. Um, so this is just an example, but you can see with the pie chart some really clear indications of where this person could make some change where they're doing really well and it's sort of a smaller section of their carbon footprint. Um, and then everything's themed really easily to understand. So move, eat, power. It's not particularly overwhelming, but it gives you a really simple snapshot of, of where you're contributing um, some higher, higher areas of carbon emissions. Uh, it shows your ranking up against New Zealand average and the world. Um, and it sets a target there, which is the future fit target um, of, of getting down to 5.3 tonnes by 2025. Once you're in the tool, you've done your quiz, you then have um, some actions that you can take part in. There is no set actions that have to be done first or last. It's where you feel comfortable with starting. They're, again, in the categories, so you can look at perhaps... Um, you know, just for example, in the climate change world, sometimes it can be quite confrontational if you say you have to do something this way to make meaningful change if it's somebody's lifestyle choice. But I think this gives enough options where people can see where they find their comfort level and start making changes accordingly. I'm just touching on our campaign. So we will first launch internally. This will happen um, before the end of the month. Chris Ingalls has kindly starred in a series of videos which we will be using internally. Um, we look at him doing the quiz, 
getting his results and reactions and then also where he will start looking at his actions. So I think that'll be a really great way to really get the internal organisation on board using this tool with such great ambassadors out in the community. It makes sense to, to light that fire here in our building first. Um, moving to our external launch. Uh, so we have received a huge wealth of, of collateral items from Auckland City Council, which was the, the creators of the tool. So that really makes life a lot easier. There's no need to reinvent the wheel as such. Uh, however, we will be making particularly the images and the content more Bay-centric. Um, we'll be using the um, addition of, of Te Reo, which was not in the Auckland launch. We'll also be making sure we tailor it to communities of all areas across Aorohi, not just city, but our rural communities. Um, down the coast and in different areas rather than it being a little bit city focused at the moment. Um, we'll be doing paid media schedule as well, which will support again some of our TAs in that level where they perhaps don't have funding to put towards the project, utilising our social calendars. And as part of the campaign, there's a calendar of, of themes. So they're seasonal, they make sense, they follow, for example, Move, which is over the summer months, getting people outdoors, biking to work, etc. Um, and then after our external launch, we'll be really delving down a bit more into the community engagement. So challenging other businesses to get involved, community groups, um, and really trying to get that excitement going. In terms of the internal uh, launch, have you given any thought to having a counsellor star alongside uh, Mr Ingle? And if you uh, haven't, I'd like to nominate Councillor Thurston. I think he'd be an outstanding... <laughs> Well, wow, funny you should say that. Our next slide <laughs> is, oh, sorry, no. If we just skip one more, I'll, we'll have a little, that's just some examples of our collateral. But we very much are interested in <laughs> some councillor involvement. I think it would be amazing. I've got a few ideas um, of where people feel comfortable committing. Could be as simple as sharing and promoting um, our messages now collateral all the way up to being a full ambassador, doing a series of videos, letting us follow along your journey. Um, but don't all put your hands up at once. Amazing. I just recognise uh, Councillor Winters has had his hand up for quite a while. So, um, Councillor Winters. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi, Nick. Um, just following on from Kat's question uh, during Enviro Hub, that was the first time I'd seen their um, app that they're introducing. I just hope we're no, not, both of us are not both reinventing the same wheel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really good point. Um, we've already um, had some discussions with um, EnviroHub this morning and we'll keep those going on um, as to way, uh, as these two can be most complementary. Mm. Um, initially, I see the the future fits really focused on, on on carbon emissions. It's really narrowed in on that. Um, it's trying to gather a really broad range of people um, and enabling them to do that. We could direct them to a deeper environmental dive with the um, EnviroHub app um, as they get on that journey. Just an initial idea, but absolutely, we have to make them complementary. So, and, Councillor White? And, and happy to um, be an ambassador in Rotorua too, alongside Councillor Thurston oh, on his e-bike when he gets one. E-scooter. Oh, God. <laughs> Compliments the flow. No, no, just, just his disciple. Councillor White. <laughs> On mute. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I certainly applaud your endeavours here, and I'm sure... Uh, Chris and Councillor Thurston and Councillor Winters will be superstars. Um, ha having said that, you know, one of the things that as I'm going through this, you know, is, that, is the attitudinal shift and change that's required. It's hard enough getting communities together, let alone individuals. So that's a big challenge in itself. And actually looking at the, 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 the comments out there, in, in the general comments, you hear about we're only a small country, we can't make much of a difference. So you get that sort of dark stuff coming across. And you also get the sense that, you know, government committed to buying offsets overseas and you read about well, how that is a, a little bit of a bit of a journey and some of the things are a little bit false in that space. So against all of that, you know, I mean, I, 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 would, I would really hope that you 
that we dig deep in the communications to try and get that attitudinal shift up and, and lift it up a bit. Because without that, this is a nice exercise, but I'm, but I'm not sure that it will get the necessary percentage shift that, we'll, that we've been hoping for. Just my thoughts. And if I could just add <clears throat> my thoughts and just picking up on a theme that came through about headwinds, um, I think it would be really useful to, to also promote or showcase or show the difficulties uh, that some people face in terms of wanting to come on this journey. For example, uh, catching a bus. Um, and that could well then relate to, you know, what we do in that PT space. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic, but I also think we need to actually um, showcase some of the headwinds and maybe what that might mean that we're going to have to do to assist to get around some of those um, headwinds. Anyway, uh, have you... Sorry, Councillor Von Dartles. Yeah, just I noticed there's no um, scooter. I'm talking about powered scooters uh, in, in your proposition there. And uh, I use a Vespa every day, practical, depending on the weather, um, which we have a bit of bad luck with weather at the moment. Um, but it's not there. So where do I fit into that? Um, are you going to account for all modes of transport? Uh, thank you. So I guess there's, there's a few layers to that. Um, the people who we've been working with at Auckland City Council are also really open to adjusting the tool and are really open for feedback. So if there's areas that we think are really important and valuable for our community to be added, that's a conversation they're more than happy to have. Um, I guess from a from a calculations point of view, it would sit within a fossil fuel driven vehicle, even if it is lesser than than a four wheeled vehicle. Um, but I think it's definitely something to consider, and I think the value of this tool is also to encourage those types of conversations. It's to have people saying, well, what about this action that I take every day, and how about when I do this in my life? Is that as environmentally friendly as I as I thought. So I think having those conversations going on is also a key part of this tool of, of making it relatable and having people be able to. I think to your point, sorry, Councillor Johnson, I know you want to um, move on. Um, but it's, this is about personal choice and about personal understanding and knowledge being power. And um, it's really difficult with all the, oh, we're just going to buy offsets overseas or we're only little, all of that stuff. And it just becomes too hard. But this is about, actually, this is my contribution and here are some little things I can do. And wow, I already do that. And just you know, at the end of the day, personal choice will drive everything else. Mm -hmm. People choose that they want to start taking all of these buses will need to provide all these buses. If people start to choose these things, they'll get provided. Um, so this is about the personal choice. So it's a different angle, which is one we haven't been on before. Councillor Scott. Um, yeah, a uh, couple of things. First, I'm a bit concerned that we um, that we were unaware of what EnviroHub was doing in something in a very similar space. So I'm just wondering what our communication levels were at such that we seem to be passing each other like ships in the night and have very similar programs. The second question I have is um, about, did have you, have you had any indication from Auckland about their level of success with this and how they measured that? And then there's a third question, which is around the budget for this. So what is the cost of, of the subscription? And what is going into the communication plan, which got videos and paid media and, and staff time and, and so on, collateral changes. So there's three things there. Uh, thank you. So thinking about we've had uh, actually budget set aside from this for, for some time as part of our climate change action plan. Um, we had a very similar project that um, as we were sort of slowly ticking away with future fit, going through different technical changes as they um, added the addition of being able to do the regional functionality. We had a project that we we're going to get off the ground, which we've since moved some budget from because it's a very similar awareness raising tool. Um, in terms of the, the video and, and things like that, we'll be doing a lot of that in-house. I think it's a grassroots 
you are doing changes, I'm trying to do changes type of a, a campaign. So I think if it looks like it's very much um, ambassadors in the community rather than getting anything professional outsourced is going to be key for our communications campaign. It needs to be really relatable. Um, again, we're going to do photography ourselves to support the campaign, Got getting lots of different faces within the, the community. Um, we got $30,000. Yeah, thirty thousand dollars in the last LTP to support the project, and and all of its totality. Uh, there is also an element where we've supported the the territorial authorities with obtaining subscription where that wasn't possible for them, so that it's really inclusive across the region as well. Two further questions, I think you had. One is about how how we seem to miss each other like ships in the night on similar projects. And the second one um, is about the measures of success that Auckland's had and how successful was it? Thank you. Sorry. Um, yes, so for the measures of success, it was done on, on a quite a uh, varied scale from Auckland City Council. Um, we also have regular meetings with them in which we liaise and, and do different feedback options on where they felt their success lay. Um, a lot of it was, was quite detailed in terms of the success of channels, so where they spent money and got X amount of people to then commit to signing up and then engaging with the tool. Um, it was also, um, I mean, I, I can distribute as well some, some clearer information on exactly the, the figures, which I don't have to hand, on how many percentages of the, the community did participate in it. Um, but it was to the point where they seen value in financing the the tool enough to then roll it out across Aotearoa and make this functionality open to everybody. Um, so that would, would speak volumes, but more than happy to get some, some details together for you. Question, which is actually the first question, um, <laughs> about the, we need to make sure that we connect with them on this. Um, we're really well connected with EnviroHub, but obviously these things have been um, being developed um, separately. So we've got some work to do to make sure we're aligned. Do you think there's anything systemic about that or was it just this is a one-off, do you think? Oh, absolutely one-off, yep. Okay, so is that it? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for an excellent presentation. So you've sought our guidance, you've got that. Well mediated, Nick. Uh, and so I shall move receipt of the report, seconded by Councillor McMillan. I think that's what we had to do, was it? Beg your pardon? Yes, it was. So all those in favour say aye against, carried. Well done. Thank you. Right, we've got uh, three reports to go, and we're aiming to be finished no later than one o'clock, which is uh, in half an hour's time. Um, <clears throat> so we've got Essential Freshwater Program update. Uh, Nikki and team come forward. I am going to ask Namuta to just make some opening comments. Um, thank you for the report, uh, which highlights really the headwinds that this program is facing. And I want to urge staff now and going forward to be absolutely upfront with us in terms of these headwinds and how we're going to deal with them, because this uh, is painting a, uh, a picture, uh, which this major part of our, our work program is being impacted. And so I really want, I really urge you um, to really be upfront with us. Uh, I thank you for the report, which I think was pretty upfront but it, it, it reads that there are many headwinds here and we need some assurance about that we are going to be able to, um, I guess, make progress uh, despite those headwinds. But if not, let's, let's understand what the issues are. So, Namuta, uh, would you just be kind enough to make some opening comments and then pass to the team? Sure. Tēnā koutou, councillors. Uh, so we are on page 95 of your agendas, the Essential Freshwater Policy Programme update. As Councillor Thompson has, has mentioned, there are many headwinds in this space, 
and the team will be talking through uh, as part of our update what those headwinds are, um, particularly flagging, and uh, you would have seen it in the regular updates we provide to the um, Audit and Risk Committee and also to this committee, uh, the difficulties particularly in relation to uh, tangata whenua engagement and progressing uh, in that space. I think we've highlighted previously the difficulties that are occurring in that space and that we won't be able to meet current uh, the previous expectations. Um, so I will hand over to staff uh, to continue. And we also have, um, so I think you're all familiar with the staff we have around the table. Uh, Nikki Green is going to lead out as our principal advisor. We've got Katarina O'Brien, who's supporting today. We've got Kate, we've got Steph, and we've got James up front. And we also have Stephen Lamb online. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you. Tēnā kata katoa. Um, we will go as quickly as we can given the time frames. This isn't working. Um, next slide, please. So there are some slides. Briefly, the first thing we'll cover is um, the matter for decision, which is around the notification date. Then highlight some national policy and regulatory changes that have just landed or are coming. And finally, an update on where we're up to with communications and engagement. So next slide, please. So this is in section 2.1. Um, national policy statement for freshwater was updated in 2020. At the same time, the RMA was changed to say that we'll implement it by the end of 2024. So in 2020, when we were working to get approval for the program. Uh, next slide, please. Our council uh, agreed to, that we should aim to notify our regional policy statement change and regional plan change in July, 2024. Um, the paper here sets out, you did reconsider this in 2021, and the paper here sets out why we uh, currently are looking at a couple of options, but recommending that, um, that get changed to December 2024. So the two options, one, are, one is to continue with the July 2024 notification and revisit that later if or when needed. And option two is to change to December 2024. Uh, I think it's important to highlight in this paper, we have said that it's the staff view that we cannot deliver um, a reasonably robust and quality plan change by July 2024. So the reasons are in the paper in table one. Some assessment of those two options is also in the paper in table two. And the recommendation is in the paper and also up here on the screen. We'll take any questions on that. So before we have questions, I just want to say I'm going to fully support staff recommendation. Um, I think you've set out uh, extremely well um, the risks associated with not extending this, and I think it would be remiss of us to make a decision where we knew um, that we were going to have an inferior uh, plan change, and I simply think that that would be unacceptable. Um, so I'm going to support this, but I'll now open it for uh, discussion. Other councillors' um, points of view. I support too. I just um, had a question around this where in the table you talk about um, substantially more uncertainty about potential solution options for nitrogen management. Can you just, so this is kind of separate to that because I totally support that, but can you just explain that a bit more? So why is there so much uncertainty now that you thought wasn't there before? So... In, I think it was 2021, um, government had an external peer review of Overseer, which was a tool that had been used in regional plans to manage nitrogen losses um, and to allocate nitrogen. And that uh, came up with several deficiencies of Overseer um, that meant it may not be usable in future plans. Um, government then working with Overseer Limited, 
committed to funding further research and development of it and to then delivering guidance on how it could and couldn't be used. And that has been a long time coming. So we understand that we may receive draft guidance in the, in the next week. That's been something that we expected a year ago. Um, the risk tool that was being developed as a potential uh, interim or replacement has also been getting developed nationally and that has also taken a lot longer. So I guess some of the things that, that we anticipated might come in place from, from um, nationally have taken a lot longer to resolve and deliver to us for use. Yvonne Dardelson. Yeah, I just want to speak in support of the staff's recommendation. Um, I, I've read the, the paper, understand the risks, and I think we, we should do everything we can to uh, limit or mitigate the risk. Um, and also recognising, like with the, the nitrogen one, that science is moving quite fast, actually, and um, there's been some very recent research on, on the use of plantain, I think it is, um, in um, nitrogen reduction through urine um, and th so time will help us get a better outcome and uh, if you need time I'll support you 100%. Thank you. Mr Chairman. Thank you Chair. Um, as you said this is not the first time we've had this rather convoluted debate. Um, I will support the recommendation but it's on the basis that you have not convinced me that out, having outlined the issues you've raised that need to be dealt with, that they're going to be dealt with in another five months to the degree that they should be. I think our emphasis should be on advocating to the ministries that the December 24 date to have real good clarity and substantial consultation is one that we need to shift. I don't think it's within the regional council's purvey to meet these when that is the, that's the that's the difficulty we've got, December 24. Thank you, Chair. And my understanding is that we're not the only regional council who finds itself in this position, but we are unique in terms of the number of iwi and hapu organisations that we are trying, attempting to engage with. So your points are well made. And certainly, Namuta I, and Nikki, I hope that we take that up with MFE um, officials. Uh, but is there a contra view that we extend? No, there seems to be full agreement. So when we come to the end, um, I think we're going to be able to pass that uh, resolution unanimously. So we'll move on. So thank you. The next item is around the national regulatory changes. And unfortunately, there is an error in the headings. So in section three, it says program implementation again. That was actually meant to say national policy and regulatory changes. Um, so in section three, there's a summary of the changes that have recently been made to the 2020 national policy statement for freshwater and the National Environmental Standard for Freshwater. And most of those changes were in relation to the wetlands provisions, which had caused various issues in their implementation. There's some bullet points on page 100 and 101 that outline what those changes are and then the implications for the region. Um, and the next slide also outlines those. Uh, the key topic you'd uh, councillors who were councillors in the last uh, triennium would remember that we were making submissions around this special clause that got inserted. So activities in or near natural inland wetlands are um, quite heavily constrained by the National Environmental Standard for Freshwater and there's a limited number of activities that actually have a consent pathway to apply for consent for activities that might have an adverse effect on wetlands. That limited number have been added to, um, quarrying activities, landfills, etc., and a special clause got added for the Bay of Plenty. Um, and what that one means is that before a plan change is in place to rezone and set up for urban development in those areas that are covered by smart growth, um, 
there's a pathway that consent can be applied for for activities associated with that urban development um, where they're going to affect wetlands. So we do anticipate that we'll hear from, um, we've, we've had phone calls from Tauranga City, we're going to hear from them shortly on what their um, intent is under these new provisions. But we would expect that they may apply for consent either before or at the same time as the plan change process. Just if you pause for breath, there, Nikki. Um, <clears throat> this particular issue is an issue that uh, Sustainable Bay of Plenty were referring to. Uh, and so this particular special pathway has been granted um, <clears throat> for development in wetland areas uh, where um, development is proposed under UFTI and the TSP. Now, neither UFTI nor the TSP are planning instruments. UFTI is a program business case for Waka Kotahi, and the TSP is a program that derives from that. So what that means is that um, this has not been through a public consultation process. <coughs> I understand, Namurta, that in staff uh, submissions to the MFE, all of this was pointed out but to no avail. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I've also followed up with MFE on this matter too. Uh, and we do also have Ruben Fraser, who's available, just talk to the organisational impacts from a consenting perspective, uh, if that's useful. Yeah. So there's a high level issue around planning instruments and hierarchy and legal issues. The consenting issues is another matter, in my opinion. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that that to your attention because this is likely going forward to be the subject of some further discussion between regional council uh, and particularly the Western Bay sub-regional TLAs. Having said that, it is my understanding that this consenting pathway would still be governed by our coastal environment plan provisions. Is that correct? Um, no, the oh. natural inland wetland definition was amended and it's made clear that it does not apply to coastal wetlands. But our coastal wetlands are covered by the Coastal Environment yes. Plan, not the Coastal Marine Plan. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So I, I think all I was simply trying to say is that this is an issue um, and it's going to lead, I'm sure, to further discussions, Councillor Crosby. Thank you for raising that. Uh, there's also a connection to a, a later item on our agenda, which is the EMP is on uh, urban development, which we can't talk a lot about because that's starting in a process. But you know, that is, as I've said before, is a, a major driver for poor decisions. So if you look at Taronga City, they are forced to jam more houses into areas that, frankly, are not suitable. And the consequences for that further down the line are going to be quite significant, in my view. And it just shows you, it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to create houses through planning instruments, which doesn't always work. So there is a very strong linkage, the point I want to make, is between this and what we're going to discuss later. And I think the challenge that came from Sustainable Bay of Plenty, which I agree with, is, you know, as Peter, I think, said, you know, um, how strong are you going to be, this council, actually? He said it a different way uh, on the previous issue, but how strong are we actually going to be and stand up and actually uh, do something about it. And so, councillors, the issue that we've been talking about is the conflict between national policy directive instruments, such as what Councillor Crosby has said, NPS for urban development versus NPS productive uh, protection of productive soils versus NPS fresh water. In many places, they are in conflict, and until such time, as we have an overarching national planning framework, which will provide direction in terms of which is going to get priority, blah, blah, we are going to be in a difficult position. And we are not going to be in a position to have a national planning framework for five to seven to 10 years. That 
is the reality. So this whole five-year window of opportunity is going to test us. It is going to be our greatest challenge in terms of how we actually manage what are clear conflicts uh, going forward. So that's that's our challenge, I think, going forward. So sorry to have to say that, but we are headed in for some uh, interesting times. So sorry, Nikki, um, didn't mean to take over your show. That's okay. I, I would just make one further comment, which is that now that that clause says um, we must insert that clause, re council is required to um, process the consent application when it comes. <clears throat> so the other topics that I've got in the paper here to bring to your attention is that the pending freshwater farm plan regulations and the decisions on pricing emissions from agricultural activities are both due to land in March this year. Um, I think the Operations and Monitoring Committee will receive updates once we see the farm plan regulations as to what that means for implementation from the essential freshwater policy programs perspective the timing of these will will create communications challenges for us as we enter into our public communications period in April uh, and also probably we will need to spend time helping our communities understand these in relation to our draft regional plan content at the same time. So I've raised those matters for your information as soon as we see those, the actual content of the regulations, we'll report those to you. So the reality is that over the last few years, we've had a rolling mall of reform, which is still ongoing, which is impacting this major work program. Uh, it beggars belief in terms of have, how we have to cope with this and the resource that is being applied when this ongoing rolling um, mall of reform keeps happening. It is what it is. Uh, we've accepted that, but goodness gracious me. Oh, and by the way, I did hear our new Prime Minister say yesterday that there will now no longer be any further development on flood-prone land. <laughs> so no building <laughs> interesting comment and I do think someone needs to follow up with the Prime Minister's comment in terms of what was he referring to is there going to be further legislation now is there going who knows but anyway so sorry Nikki over to you again so the final topic today uh, next slide is around the communications and engagement that we have planned. So the slide is our overarching program slide, 2023, we've got a, uh, some key things going on, certainly a lot more policy options, development work and assessment, uh, lots of informal briefings with yourselves to, to um, get you across the topics and prepare for the decision-making phase lots of engagement out into the community. So I'll hand over now to Stephanie to talk through the slides around our engagement. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Jenny, if you could skip the next slide. One more. Brilliant. Um, as we've talked about, we're in a two-phase approach to our communications and engagement. We're currently in the first phase, January to March, looking at building awareness in the wider community of the changes coming to freshwater management. We've eagerly prepared to go to a number of community events, and we managed to get to our first one last weekend um, out at uh, the Tapoki AMP show, which is actually in Paingaroa, and had a really good response from the community that we met with. So we're seeking to connect with people who are not across what's happening. Uh, there's a fantastic regional booklet that's been shared with councillors that we were sharing with the community to outline the high-level issues of what's coming. Uh, we will be at the Tauranga AMP show this weekend, and a reminder about that will go into the councillors' strategic engagement update. If anyone would like to join us, you're more than welcome. It will be there, open to the public from nine. Uh, we have a series of other events that are happening around the region, some of which we've had to rejig due to weather and um, due to other competing events. Uh, next slide, please, Jenny. 
Um, our community engagement is focused on the April to September period, where there will be consultation on issues that are specific to each draft freshwater management unit, as well as, well as region-wide changes. Uh, if you've got your agenda in front of you, you might see the extensive calendar on page 106. That's a draft calendar of proposed community-facing events. Uh, by my count this morning, there are 56 proposed community events uh, in addition to anything that might be happening specifically with uh, individual iwi, with the Regional Environmental Sector and Organisation Forum, with the TLAs. So it's quite a full calendar, uh, and we have shared this draft with our iwi, iwi partners, with um, the RESOF group, with our um, TLAs to get some initial feedback around how we can best connect with all these different audiences over that period. Uh, there's some, been some fantastic collateral. There's uh, an image up there of the booklet, or Kate's booklet. Uh, and also you'll see we've got a, a ripper pad, a sheet that we're taking to all our community events. So if people want to indicate an interest in a particular freshwater management unit, great. Give us your email address and we'll make sure that you're the first to hear about events as they're confirmed in your neighbourhood. Kate, is there anything you'd like to add around collateral or the advertising that's starting up? Uh, thanks, Steph. Um, we will be launching journaly in the coming weeks um, before, um, through around Aurohi, um, some light radio, uh, digital display and some print advertising. It'll all be very high level key messages around this is what's to come, watch this space, find out more information by heading to our website. Uh, our website has also been updated to, to reflect the most um, up to date in terms of how people can get involved in, and to watch this space. Uh, the booklet is also available online, so it is starting to, to come to fruition, which is great. So before you move on to this slide, I, I, I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. I want you to be up front. How far behind are we in terms of tangata whenua engagement? And Kata, Katarina, I'm probably looking to you and Stephen um, but, you know, we need to understand, um, and the paper sets it out pretty well, and my read of that is that we are way behind and we've got huge challenges in the space for very good reason, but can you just tell us how, how worried you are about the situation? Kia ora, Madam Chair, and Stephen, you go first, <laughs> and then I'll tag team with you. Thanks, thanks, Katarana. Uh, kia ora, uh, Kato councillors. Um, apologies for not being there in person. Um, I think I'd rephrase the question, uh, and I think I've said this before, that the NPSFM had some very high expectations. Um, my view is I don't know any place in New Zealand which will meet those expectations about what um, a perfect world would look like for planning in this space. So are, are we behind, I think, becomes would we ever have got there in the first place? Um, so, and this is particularly around um, Mataranga Māori, the, you know, the, the information out of the knowledge systems, um, and the, there was, I think, this expectation that, that each plan would have a series of appendices with this information in it. Um, I don't know that that really was ever a reality, and I'm, and I'm probably oversimplifying this. Uh, councillors will be um, very aware of the draws on capacity um, that iwi, hapu, trusts, and, and marae are facing. Um, and so the question is, how does our planning framework, and that's the plan and the future, respond to this challenge of us not at this stage being able to tick off exactly what the MPSFM is saying, even though, as I've said, it's unlikely we would have ever have got there. So you know, we, we're using the term best, best endeavours and in good faith. You know, we are trying to do this wherever we can. So, for example, we are running a consistent invite to meet with any Tangafino group. Um, you know, it's not a flood, but it is a trickle. Uh, we're also running a number of engagement projects. So we, we are working towards this, this challenge. Kat, do you want to perhaps take over there? Thank you, Stephen. Um, so... Yeah, full and frank, it is very, very challenging. In fact, the start of 2023 was a challenge in itself because across the region in the first month, so that's all through January, unfortunately, there were tangies all over the region. And I know in the Eastern Bay alone, they were 
this is our marae's hapuni. We were hit with tangi week after week after week, and they're still recovering from that. Um, and also the floods. So if we thought iwi and hapu were distracted last year, they are, they are very distracted this year already. We are competing for their attention with a lot of other agencies and councils who also want to engage and get information from them. So what we are using is uh, our ability uh, to assist with their capacity and capability. We're drawing on relationships like we've never done before. And uh, we're going to take the advice from our Māori councillors and also draw on their relationships in the future coming engagements that we've got planned. We do have some quite exciting contracts that are progressing well in the background. We've almost um, completed the contract uh, that MFE and the three iwi from Tauranga Moana have in terms of delivering some freshwater um, projects. That has taken us some months, uh, not due to us, it's just bureaucracy and MFE, um, but that's quite an exciting uh, project. And we also have another exciting project um, in Mātātua, the Mātātua Wai Māori project. I'll just um, ask Councillor Eti and Councillor White, who, and would you like to speak, Councillor McDonald? Okay. So, uh, Councillor Eti. Uh, kia ora, Madam Chair. Kia ora, Koto. Uh, my question was actually to to Steph um, on our, I feel like I'm backtracking a bit. Um, it was on our engagement and, and us requesting staff to have full and frank conversations with us. And at times, I feel like we risk not having full and frank discussions with our constituents because we put out collateral and have engagements at a very high level. Uh, I feel we run the risk of them not being fully... I know it's incredibly difficult, and I, I agree with uh, uh, Stephen saying best endeavours and, um, and uh, operating in um, good faith. Uh, but I do feel that when we roll out some of our engagements, they are high level and that our uh, constituents don't really get a feel for the complexities that we are aware of. We get these full briefings and um, the challenges that we have ahead of us. I just wonder uh, if our staff have considered, I guess, the pros and cons about how deep we share um, or how fully we share the complexities of these issues with uh, with our public and whether they share the same concerns I do. Steph, do you want to comment? I'll give it my best. Um, we recognise that this is an incredibly complex space and that different audiences are going to be ready to engage with us at different levels. Uh, on Saturday in Pangaro, people were asking, is this three waters? Um, so we're still having though that level of conversation with some people. Um, and in the collateral, um, if you have a look at the booklet, for each freshwater management unit, we've categorised them by the scale of change required. Um, and you'll see the red catchments um, where there's significant level of change required, say, for water quality quantity um, and looking at groundwater as well. Some people are looking at that space. And I guess in this stage of the conversation, we want to flag with people that big changes coming for your freshwater management unit, come and have that, that deep conversation with us about the specifics from April. Um, we'll have those conversations face-to-face -face at events, but we also have a plethora of documents that are the scientific reports and the evaluations where those who are the experts, people who've been with us on this journey for quite some time, can dig right into. So I think we're going to have different levels of conversations, um, high level, at this stage, uh, digging in deep with the um, the freshwater management booklets that are being drafted at present for the specifics for your, your freshwater management unit, and then dig into the data conversations for those, those experts um, and industry level advocates. Anything you want to add to that, Kate? No, you've covered that well, Steph. It's, it is a huge challenge because as Steph mentioned, there are people who have been on this journey and people who this will be the first time hearing from it. So we are really just working hard to make sure we're catering different 
communications of, of information for, for the appropriate audiences. Councillor White and then Councillor MacDonald. <clears throat> yeah, kia ora. I mean, one of the big difficulties for a lot of our people out there and certainly our leadership out there is the fact that we're up to our neck deep in, in water here with the deprivation statistics that our people face, housing problems, all those things come into the mix. And then you get to a group of leaders who are trying to lead out to capture uh, the principles and values of our people from a well-being perspective and trying to reset their thinking into that space, whether it's doing aquaculture, whether it's doing farming, forestry. Those fundamental principles are drivers for change for iwi. And I've always been an advocate for the fact around this council table that actually when you go out to engage with iwi, you're engaging governance to governance. If we're a council member and I'm a council board member, I will engage with the, with the, with the governance of those entities, the chairs of different entities, because they actually are voted in by a group of beneficiaries to actually take charge and lead. So if we're going to consult, I do, I do um, uh, support engaging governance to governance because our staff will struggle to, under, to, to work with the political dynamics out there. So basically, you know, and, and they can only go so far, and I've said this before. And so that makes the task even harder because you'll go out with all these documents and all the plans and, and, and aspirations you have but largely it'll fall on deaf ears because their priorities simply aren't there and you're engaging at the wrong level. I mean, I, I, I really would, would argue that, um, you know, from a governance level, we do need to engage with the leaders. And I'm, I'm certainly an advocate for that. And I can quote the Waihi situation as one of those particular examples. You would have been pushing it uphill if you had just gone straight to the people on the ground. It just does not work with Iwi. You've got to be able to get that political will there to help drive from the ground up. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I understand the difficulties and the challenges. The other thing that I'm, I'm going to put on the table here is I mentioned the principles and values and the interpretation that we put on the different words that Māori use, like um, manakitanga, kaitiakitanga. And, the, and I, I would, I would uh, really uh, implore the, uh, the council and our staff not to try and reinterpret those words in a, from another cultural perspective. Kaitiakitanga, for example, I'm only saying this just to put it in, on the table, for Māori isn't just guardianship, it goes back to our creation story, relationship between heaven and earth and the, the, and the world in between and how we relate to all things. Everything stems from that particular uh, notion of reset, going back to all things in balance. So, so I'm just one, so these are the things that are in the, on, in the thinking of iwi and anything else sort of is just a little prop on the side. And so they lose interest in the conversation. So I'm just basically giving you a, a very, very quick smorgasbord of the challenges we have. But I would say, Toy mentioned we at a high level. I agree that often you go through through the staff to uh, iwi on the ground. It's at a high level, and they their eyes glaze over. To be quite blunt, you need iwi themselves at the leadership level to be able to interpret it, to hold it, interpret, it, and bring it down to our people that to understand what's going on here, the importance of drawing the priorities around what the regional council is thinking, the implications for us. So, sorry, that's just my, uh, my broad brush um, notion of why it's so challenging, but we can meet those challenges, uh, but we've got to be a little bit more thinking about how we reset that. That's just my view. Councillor MacDonald. Uh, Thank you, staff, for your um, report. Um, I guess um, having a past life of sitting in your place, um, I'm coming. I'm going to come from your lens, and really, it's about the how and the when. Uh, that's the the dilemma you have. And I firstly want to say that I think we we need to use Committee Māori a lot more and uh, to drive this issue for us through that platform. And I guess what I'm saying to you, Kat is that we need to build this into our work program over the next 12 months, um, maybe the following year if we want to achieve it in December 2024. If we place this on our work program so that we in each of the sub-regions, it is a topic about that sub-region and the need for us to be speaking with hapu, whānau, iwi within that um, sub-region. And let's be specific when we're in those sub-regions um, so it becomes relevant to those in those regions to be able to, I guess, understand 
uh, the work, the mahi that we're having to to do, and the expectation of the participation of Fano Hapu Marae within each of those regions. I think if we make it uh, rohi specific, it gives more relevance and the and the desire to become involved in that. Um, the other thing I want to to state is there is already work going on in the Māori landscape. I know for, for one that FOMA are being very proactive in talking to Māori, to talking to farmers about the implications of MPS. I know that certain hapu are already starting to employ their own resource management practitioners to help them decide, decipher the legislations that's coming forward. Um, last week, and I was, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the hapuhui of Ngai Tukairangi, who have employed a full-time resource management uh, resource planner, um, and that is exactly what they did. They went over the legislation, she described what, what it was all about, and the expectation of the implications for that specific hapu. I know that the Runanga and Tauranga Moana have also built resource managements to help them um, through um, Three Waters and also the MPS. So that work is going on. What we need to do um, through our staff is just kind of touch base um, and uh, provide whatever support we can uh, from our side to help them in those workshops that they are having with their own people. Um, the other thing I want to, um, oh, God, it's going to slip my mind. No, I had the one more. I can't think of it now. I had all these things that were happening on the outside. Oh, the other thing I wanted to ask, um, going back to work programs, I also think we need to use our own partnership forums, uh, TMAG, uh, Kaituna uh, River Co-Governance, Rangataiki River Governance. I think these these um, reports also need to be on those work programs as well. As well. So it's every avenue that we have partnering with iwi that we can use to have these discussions. I think we've got quite a good lineup of uh, forum and partnerships that exist that I think we need to think seriously about how we put these onto those work programs and drive these through those to be an, to enable us to get the feedback that we need and perhaps the, the contact will, that will derive out of that. Um, so that's kind of my... Um, advice to staff. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor MacDonald. Thank you for that. And um, great timing because we will be discussing the Committee Māori Work Plan at your committee meeting next week. And um, we have, uh, in the draft, suggested some sub-regional marae hui across the region, which may be um, the place where we can have some, some good discussions on this with Tangata Whenua. And I believe that we have be, we have factored in uh, presentations to all our co-governance forums and other such committees this year as well. Thank that, you. That's excellent. And I think it's the other opportunity that we should take too is inviting those various groups that are already doing their work to come and present to us of what they're actually doing. Thank you. Councillor Ishii. And hear you, Toy. Can you hear me now? Hello, checking one, two, three. Can you hear me? Checking. Checking one, two, three. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Bye -bye. Okay, so just a, a couple more things, Madam Chair. Uh, just to uh, uh, further to uh, Council McDonald's comments regarding utilizing our current. Uh, co-governance uh, groups that we we're involved with. I was part of the, a, a workshop with uh, the Ohiwa Harbour Implementation Forum uh, around freshwater. And my feedback would be to staff, and I understand the challenge again, this goes back to the, I guess, the levels of engagement uh, that Steph was talking about with regards to um, my last question. We really do need to find a way, and Councillor White did mention this, a way to communicate better to lay people with regards to these issues and especially to Māori because they, and I mean, that workshop itself broke down quite a bit 
chairman leader was there himself um, because of other issues uh, to do with, I guess, their defensiveness with council, the historical uh, relationship issues that we've had, and they are still very much present. And so going into that kind of environment where they're already a bit suspicious, already a bit standoffish, and then we go in with our experts, and I really felt for our staff, um, Ruben was fantastic and I think uh, saved the day, but he had to change tact in the way that he communicated because he could see that it wasn't uh, the slides that we came in with, the way that we were, uh, you know, I think our staff are so specialists and they come from a particular space and a particular um, corridor and jargon. They try their best to then traverse into these other spaces where you have lay people who, um, uh, and there's a lost in translation issue. So I think that is something that we absolutely have to work on. How do we go into these spaces and um, and and communicate communicate better? That's a, a giant challenge that I think we have for our already overworked staff. Um, and uh, the other uh, comment I was going to make with regards to uh, our iwi, I would say runanga, that do have capacity, they are actually facing the same challenges that we are with regards to staff retention. I know a lot of the runanga at the moment, I've just heard of several cases where they've lost staff to DOC and to uh, the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, so uh, that's another challenge uh, that we're facing with regarding to engaging with those organi Māori organisations that actually have quite a large capacity um, they're having challenges retaining staff when, as soon as the staff leave, um, we're having to start again, largely with the relationships and the communication. So I, um, it's, it's a, a huge uh, challenge that we have ahead of us. Kia ora. Certainly is, Mr Chairman, and you, I think, should be the last speaker. I'm just conscious we, we're we really running up against it now. Um, thanks, Chair. So... I don't have an issue with your engagement program, but it's actually how that I think you need to consider. So when I see a whole lot of the stuff sorted out, sorted out here, two things. Firstly, and I'll give you an example. If you're going to the Waitahi catchment, um, I would endeavour to, because farmers at the moment are so overladen with forums that they just shut off. So if you're going to have a forum there, then my view is you need to involve something like Dairy NZ. Maybe they bring it together or the Fonterra people. So it becomes a meaningful issue that everybody can listen to. The second part of it is I would also invite Tangata Whenua there as well so they can have the same forum. You may want a separate forum with them latterly, but um, I agree. This is a difficult job for our Māori councillors, and I, I, I need some further discussion with Te Taru or Councillor White because... There's two forums you're telling to play with. You're tending to want to converse with the political level. The political level frequently are not those manafakahiri, which are the people on the ground, and that's got to be resolved. So in my circumstances where I live, the iwi is whakatoia. Would I consult iwi? Would I consult whakatoia primarily? No, I wouldn't. I'd go to Upukarehi and I'd involve them in that discussion. And they can sort out the political differences themselves. But this is a really difficult and I think the most challenging issue you're going to face in terms of these freshwater reforms. And I rest my case in terms of the earlier comment to make, you know, I don't think you will get to a point where everybody's going to be satisfied. Someone is ultimately going to have to make a decision um, about that's the position we're going to adopt. So... <clears throat> Stephen, did you want to, you've listened to all of that. Um, my understanding is that, are you now the program lead for Tangata Whenua engagement or not? I have, I'm have. i not quite sure. Uh, at, at the moment I am. I'm sitting in that seat. Um, okay. So you, you, you've sat there and listened to the conversations. Any final comments you want to make? <laughs> um, not really. Um, I think you asked us to be um, free and frank about this, so perhaps I won't. Um, I'll... I think it might be that I can talk to the Maori councillors separately, uh, because in a sense, it, it, we, we do recognise all these problems. The, the question is, how do we get through it? 
Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that the engagement which happens on the ground with a smaller number of people around a particular issue is where, is where all the gold is for the planning, planning staff. Uh, it becomes a capacity issue, though. Um, so we, we're sort of try, trying to juggle a number, th number of things here. Um, and again, we'll be able to do some of this, but not all of it. And I think that's, that's where we go. Madam Chair, if so, I can just make a no comment. Yep, if, if I may, Madam Chair, um, I heard that uh, the Chair has said, um, you know, one of the issues that we've got, we've got post settlement government entities, we've got uh, iwi, we've got hapu. The, the genesis of the authority or the mana rests with the, with, the, with the hapu, no doubt about that from an iwi perspective. The PSG is a, a crown structured institute to take the treaty settlements. From a mana position, they have, they have a money position, but not necessarily a money, mana position. If you look at the iwi themselves, they are a conglomerate of the hapu. So basically, where do you start? I'm an advocate for creating scale when you want to try and get something really as best you can get it together. And so I would I would look at the iwi end, but also making sure that the hapu are included in that particular space. So that's the to me that's the ultimate solution if you can get that because without that scale you're going to get plays. The dynamics of Māori will come and play, and they'll play each other off. In fact, they should be cohesive in their approach if you can manage that, and then you get some sense of direction. Without that, you're going to get left, right, centre, and you're going to get bashed. That's just my view. Thank you. Well, I think what we've done is we've just added to your burden, <laughs> tried to be helpful, and I'm sure that um, you're going to have good discussions going forward with the Māori uh, councillors. Uh, but goodness gracious me, we're going to have to uh, do some scenario planning, I think, and, you know, the scenarios are going to have to be what we would have liked to have done to, you know, what's going to be actually possible. So looking forward to some further updates in that space. Are you finished? Okay. If there isn't any further debate or discussion, I'm going to move the recommendations, which includes, thank you, what's happened to second, Councillor von Dartelsen. I'm going to put those, which includes extending the <clears throat> notification date out. Is it notification? Yeah, to uh, December 2024. Um, moved and seconded. No further debate and discussion. All those in favour, aye against and carried, and our very best wishes to you. Thank you for being full uh, and upfront uh, with us. These are difficult times, and I can't think of anyone in this country who isn't feeling overwhelmed at the moment by a range of issues. So uh, we've got two reports to go. Update on proposed uh, plan change six. NASA uh, is with us. This is about the appointment uh, of a hearings uh, panel. I'm going to take the report as read. Is there anything further that you would like to add to your report? Councillors, Madam Chair, for you, Madam Chair, just want to introduce Samantha Pottage. Recently new acquirement uh, comes with high accolades as a consent planner from Tauranga City Council. We seem to have this informal reciprocal relationship with Tauranga City Council in terms of exchanging staff. So um, Sam is going to be taking over from Ruth um, leading this change through to the hearings and, and that process. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Um, do, is there anything you want to add to the report? Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, the only thing that there was to add to the report was a summary of the further submissions. So the further submission period closed on Friday and we received 13 further submissions. All further submissions were made by original submitters. The makeup of those further submissions were two iwi hapu Māori land trusts, three government agencies, five developer representatives and three industrial, industrial and rural business representatives. And all of those further submissions um, were a mix of support and opposition of their original submissions. Thank you, councillors. The report is self-explanatory. I have a personal view that there should be a minimum of two elected councillors uh, on this hearings panel. And in fact, I'd be happy to see three. Um, so, and I... Um, just now invite anybody to ask any questions or make any comments. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I concur with the Chair in terms of having two 
regional councillors on here. Um, this is a very important plan change. Um, and I think that we need a level of experience in terms of urban planning um, to participate in this forum. Who you want in terms of the independence and Tangata Whenua representative, I'll take advice from you. But, Chair, am I, am I able to suggest a couple of councillors or is that your domain? No, I'm happy to do that, but I think Councillor Von Dardelson, did you want to make a comment before we get to who's who's going to be on it? Uh, yeah, I, look, I concur that we should have at least two, if not three. Um, personally, I believe this is a count should be a council-driven process. Um, there is nothing like local knowledge, and if you want to bring in somebody from Auckland who's sat on the Auckland unitary change and has that expertise, uh, so be it. But in actual fact, uh, we want people who understand the issues locally and if you've got the right expertise locally, you should use it. Um, uh, I think that's probably all I want to say. So um, I, I absolutely support the the chair and, and actually would say at least a minimum of three. Any further comments before we talk about the who's who? There isn't. Okay, nominations for uh, councillor representation uh, on this important panel. So, Chair, um, I'd like to suggest Councillor Knees and yourself as starters, but it does leave the issue of where do you think the chair certification should sit here? Should it sit with the council? Should it sit with an external? And I noticed the commentary in here, one of the externals is only really interested if they chair. I'm, I have no knowledge of the individuals, but as a starter, I think yourself and Councillor Knees are uh, uh, all over this issue of urban planning. But one of the things that I took out of reading the attached list of submissions, and I'd ask you to consider it in terms of the skills that you're looking to sit on this planning, is a significant, for, a significant concern from some of the submitters about the reserve, reverse sensitivity issues. I'm not over the detail, but that just jumped out at me as being a real major issue that they're going to have to deal with. Madam Chair, would you like me to comment on that matter? Mm -hmm. So the uh, operative RPS already includes a fairly robust policy framework addressing effects, including reverse sensitivity effects. Um, so I think those matters are already covered, and I think they're also essentially beyond scope uh, of the change given what we... The direction of the committee earlier was to do the minimum required to give effect to the MPSUD, and I think we've done that. So those issues, as far as I'm concerned, are already appropriately dealt with in the existing operative RPS. So, councillors, any further suggestions for nominations from a councillor uh, perspective, or you can either self-nominate or nominate someone else? Is there any further nominations? Chairman, if that's a nomination from our chairman, I'm happy to second it. Okay, we'll deal. Thank you, Councillor Thurston. We'll deal with the rest of the panel. Uh, advice, please, in terms of the appropriateness of uh, the chair uh, of this panel being an independent, uh, as per the paper, or uh, being uh, obviously, if it's going to be uh, from the council, then it would be Councillor Nees. So, um, any staff comments? Oh, Councillor Von Dardelson? Um, I, I would suggest that a, um, that be left to, as a delegated authority uh, once you've selected your panel to um, a, a small group, including the CEO of the council, maybe the chair and, and, and one of the commissioners. I don't know. Um, the issue we have is that Dr Phil Mitchell has indicated that if he were to be nominated, he's only interested in the chair position. I have asked staff, can you, are you prepared to comment in terms of the appropriateness of an independent uh, chair versus an elected member as the chair? So uh, I think it would be appropriate to appoint an independent as a chair if you're going to have uh, more than 
to councillors. Um, I don't have any solid rationale for that. I'm just going on um, the makeup of committees previously. Um, we tend to have an independent as a chair. We've got some good experience, bar Chloe Trenouth, no hearing experience and not a chair endorsed. So you'd have to cross that person out. And um, also, if you're going to leave that decision up to a later a, a, a panel, um, not to be made at this point, then I think you would look to remove Dr. Phil Mitchell for consideration because he's basically said he wants to be the chair if he's appointed. Mr. Scott? Um, yeah, just a, a, a question of procedure, really. I'm sort of uh, obviously not been through this before, but um, how appropriate is it to discuss individuals before appointing them in an open meeting? Is, is that the normal procedure? Or? So because the, their experience is public. Um, and so obviously we'd be um, conscious of the privacy legislation, but uh, we're really looking here for the best match uh, of skills um, in terms of an independent chairing position. So I'm open to your nomination. Okay, so that's too hard. So let's go to the, um, do we have a nomination for the tikanga Māori uh, expert? I would put personally uh, Raui uh, Faulkner, um, simply on the basis that uh, I am currently doing a hearing with him and his level of engagement um, was um, almost stellar. Um, in that process, so I've got absolute conf confidence um, that he will take this uh, seriously. He, while he lives in Wellington, he um, um, is um, Bay of Plenty um, born and bred, so he does understand the local issue as well um, and, and has experience. So that's... Um, but it's not that I'm saying he, because I don't know all the others, but I'm, uh, I can make a recommendation that I would have confidence that he'll do a good job, that's all. Are there further nominations? There aren't. Okay, so I'm going to ask staff for advice, please, around the appointment of the independent technical expert and the position of chair. Um, I'm presuming you want to get this sorted today. But is this a matter that can be dealt with under delegated authority? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, it would be good to get this sorted today. Um, I think the point is all except um, Chloe Trimnouth in terms of the independent technical for urban growth expert uh, have a vast amount, amount of experience. She does, Chloe does, but not as a in terms of hearing panel experience. So all the other candidates have a good amount of experience um, in the hearings and in these matters. So we were confident why we put them forward. Um, and we included Chloe because she does have a lot of experience in hearings as a planner. Um, and she put herself forward um, and had come recommended by other councils, but I'm just putting that there as an issue in terms of you wanting to have that experience as an independent, as a chair, if that is what you're seeking. In terms of the tikanga Māori experts, um, the only um, candidate there that is chair endorsed is Reginald Prophet, and he has um, a reasonable amount of hearing expertise and, and experience. Uh, but I want to acknowledge also that the council heard from um, MFE in terms of the pilot program where they're trying to um, encourage councils to um, support and give, give um, persons that have gone through the making good decisions um, process experience and hearings. And so we've already done that for a couple of persons. One of those is listed. Um, so I know there, there's a few there that have um, a lack of experience, but they're very keen to get um, in, involved in hearing 
of plan changes and we as a regional council has sponsored a lot of those persons. Councillor so, Crosby? Oh, to try and get over the hurdle of the independent, I'd support Robert Scott. When you look at his experience to date, it is a very close match to our environmental issues. He's had a considerable amount of experience uh, in the special housing area space, coastal area, etc. He's a commissioner with merit. Um, I, that's no reason why we couldn't support um, Mr. Scott. If there wasn't a contraview, that leaves us with the issue of chair. Uh, and I really, I, I think it can it not be a matter of delegated authority that this is a matter delegated to the chief executive and to the chairman um, to discuss. Through you, Madam Chair, yes, it can. Thank you. So with that, we have the following nominations, Councillor Nees and myself, Rawiriri Faulkner and uh, Robert Scott. Oh. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, here, I'd like to actually include Marimia Navirko in the consideration. Um, for uh, I know her well. She's based here. I know Rawiri as well, and he's based in Wellington. Um, yeah, it might be useful to have Rawiri because he's got that Wellington centric up. I mean, either or, but I think she's a consideration, but I won't die in the ditch over it. Councillor Eating? Uh, yeah, I've just realised that I do know who Reginald Prophet is. Reginald, Reginald was actually the um, a person who took me through my Making Good Decisions uh, program. He was one of the, uh, the facilitators. And also I worked with him down at the New Zealand Planning Institute conference, and he was quite a leader amongst the uh, the Maori uh, planning mm. institute members. Um, so he he would seem to be uh, quite a good candidate. Uh, I would say too, this seems th this is a really important hearing panel, and I would, uh, I mean, I do understand uh, where Nessa is coming from with regards to giving uh, some of the people that we have sponsored um, a go at a hearing panel, and I'm sure that all hearing panels are very important. Um, uh, but I personally would like someone who's got quite a bit of experience uh, from a tikanga Māori and uh, yeah, okay. uh, on that panel because I think it's going to be incredibly important that that person uh, can uh, be a a quality advocate. See you local. Thank you, Councillor Eti. All right, so I think we've got the councillors sorted. Yep. Um, we have suggestions in relation to uh, Reginald. I think he is, does he, he is not of the Bay of Plenty, is that correct? Uh, correct. My understanding is, uh, and Nassau, uh, he's Gisborne based? Correct, he's in Gisborne. Okay, so we have Rawiri and Maramina. Well, if you're going I'm just for going, Rawiri lives in Waikanae. Sorry? Rawiri lives in Waikanae. Yeah. There's no doubt about, Madam Chair, that we has got the abilities, um, uh, you know, to, to do this and experience over Marimina. Um, okay, she's, so... She's, she lives there. So Rawiri seems to be supported and Robert Scott. So with those nominations on board and staff can uh, put those into the um, suggested recommendations, I will move. And oh, no, I can't because I'm conflicted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seconded Councillor Crosby. Any further debate and discussion? There being none, I shall put it. All those in favour, aye against and carried. Thank you. And last but not least is the... Sorry, through the chair, can I just get a clarification that the recommendations that you moved also included uh, amendment to point number four, which was endorses a hearing panel made up of two councillors uh, as opposed to one councillor, and that in your approval that you've just given, we can insert those names that you've just identified. Absolutely. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. So moving on to our final report, uh, and that is the report in relation to our submission in terms of the natural built environment. Thank you, Nessa. 
and Samantha, 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 um, and Spatial Planning Act. You've uh, received two submissions. One is the submission from our council, and the other is the submission that's currently circulating amongst the Bay of Plenty TLAs, and so I'll hand to Namuta. Uh, so Tino Koto, councillors, we will take the report as read and happy to answer any questions. Just a reminder, we've been on a journey with the development of our submission. We started last year with that workshop, you'll recall. We developed the framework as a result of the workshop with you and the direction that you gave. We pre-circulated the draft so that we could get some initial comments. We've taken those comments uh, and we recirculated some additional amendments taken those comments on board and the version that you see in front of us uh, is the, the final. So um, we are keen to get your endorsement for both the Bay of Plenty Regional Council submission and also our submission with our joint partners, noting that was that's still being worked through. I will move. Seconded Councillor McMillan. Debate, discussion? There being none, um, I'm going to put it. All those in favour say aye against and carried. And in so doing, can I please pass on our sincere thanks uh, to staff who have worked on these submissions. I think they are very, very extensive submissions. Staff worked on them under great time constraints uh, and I think have done a very good job. And so, Julie, uh, to you and your team and Namuta, uh, our grateful thanks. So with that... Namuta, I think we're at the end, and unbelievably, it's now um, 1.30. So I'm now going to close the meeting. Thank you all for your attendance and your input in today's discussions. Interesting stuff, interesting times. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Thank yeah. you. Thank 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 you. Oh, sorry. Titaru. Yes. Sorry, Titaru. The chair just wants to make a comment. Okay. No, I was just going to say, Chair, when we've turned off that live streaming, could I have five minutes with sure. NASA and Julie in the room? Yep. Could you give us a rerun? <laughs>